Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me welcome you at the International Symposium uh, Living Heritage uh, for a Sustainable Future. I would like to welcome our guests, Dr. Martin Reeve from the United Kingdom and uh, Mrs. Uh, Milda Lavachiskiene from Lithuania. Uh, we are very happy that you are connected. And I would like to open the symposium, but at the same time the venue, Expo uh, 2023 Slovakia, which is a venue which we haven't been organized due to COVID and other reasons for a long time, but f uh, just uh, let's cut to the chase. We have many venues, 30 uh, concerts, workshops, presentations, for, for exhibitions. Uh, with participants, our friends and colleagues from seven European countries. So I would like to welcome you. Uh, we are very uh, pleased that you accepted our invitation. I would like to thank the Ministry of Culture of the Slovak Republic, which supported this venue. And I would like to wish all of us to have a great uh, event. A uh, couple of uh, technical details, as I already described in emails, uh, your presentation should be uh, 20 minutes uh, long. It doesn't have to be that long. If it's shorter, then we will have a room for discussion. Uh, on the other hand, we need to be brief and strict so, therefore, if your presentation will be uh, longer, we would have to make it shorter because we really have many venues. So, this first block should end at 3 p.m. And for the very beginning, uh, due to the fact that not everybody can be present on site, we have a couple of online presentations. And I would like to ask Dr. Tim Curtis to present. Uh, his first presentation. Dr. Curtis is the leader of the Living Heritage, uh, the Secretary of the Living Heritage uh, Department at the UNESCO, our friend, and he's the Secretary of the Convention for the Safeguarding of, uh, of uh, Living Cultural Heritage. And uh, his presentation Ladies will and be the following. Uh, um, on behalf of UNESCO, it's a great pleasure to greet you today at the opening of the International Symposium Living Heritage for a Sustainable Future, which is organized under the Folk Expo Slovakia 2023. My name is Tim Curtis, and I'm the secretary of, the, of UNESCO's 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, congratulating the organizers of this uh, wonderful event, the Center for Traditional Folk Col Culture, and for their excellent initiative uh, and to thank you for the kind invitation, of course, to give this uh, small opening message. As you know, this year marks the 20th anniversary of, the, of UNESCO's 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And for living heritage communities and bearers around the world, it's a wonderful moment to take stock of everything we've all achieved so far and also reflect on what to do in the years to come. So Folk Expo Slovakia 2023 is, of course, joining the celebrations with a wide range of performances, exhibitions, concert, lectures, creative workshops, and, of course, a symposium that will showcase and discuss good safeguarding practices and lessons learned in safeguarding living heritage from Slovakia and abroad. So given this, I'd also like to take this opportunity to commend Slovakia's strong engagement with the 2003 Convention which started in March 2006 already when Slovakia ratified the convention and has been constantly growing since then uh, and particularly so in the last few years as Slovakia has now become for the first time a member of the Intergovernmental Committee for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage and is therefore participating in the global governance of the convention uh, and helping to shape the future of this important instrument. Of course, also, we have a, a number of Slovak experts and practitioners contributing to the work of the Convention in many different ways, as members of different bodies, working groups, established on the Convention's consultants and facilitators. And much more is, of course, happening among communities and bearers at national and local levels. Uh, and also all the work that's happening in coordination with the Ministry of Culture and the Center for Traditional Folk Culture. As we all commemorate this 20th anniversary of our convention, 
We can see that there is now a firmly established recognition around the world of the importance of safeguarding the living heritage practices, expression, skills and knowledge that communities cherish and recognize as part of their identity and uh, which is, they pass on for generation to generation. This, uh, this recognition, this safeguarding, of course, can only be achieved with the full participation of those communities and practitioners. And having laid this groundwork, we're now looking towards, I think, how the Convention and Living Heritage can respond, can help us to respond to the needs and challenges we're all facing today, in particularly those related to sustainable development. These include advancing inclusive social and economic development, upholding environmental sustainability, responding to emergencies or conflicts, such as unfortunately the war we are seeing in Ukraine or the recent devastating floods or fires we've witnessed in different parts of Europe. We will be working with all stakeholders to scale up these approaches and in the various thematic areas in the coming years, and of course, look forward to and count on the active participation of our friends in Slovakia in this endeavor. So once again, I congratulate the Center for Traditional Folk Culture for celebrating the 20th anniversary of the convention with this wonderful initiative. Wish you, and I wish you all interesting discussions during the symposium and a wonderful time at the Folk Expo Slovakia 2023. Thank you very much. Dear participants. Thank you, Mr. Kurtis. Uh, thank you very much for the great speech. This is really a huge appreciation of our work and I don't want to be speaking too much about it, but uh, uh, when speaking about the intangible cultural heritage, we managed many things and uh, in a few minutes uh, Dr. Lubica Volanska will be speaking about, the, the, about this topic. She was a member of the evaluation body and she was a chairman uh, also of the committee and uh, uh, it was also her effort that Slovakia became, after many efforts, a member of the Committee for Intangible Cultural Heritage. And I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Lubica Volanska from the Institute of uh, Ethnology and Anthropology of Slovak uh, Academy of Sciences, our uh, collaborator. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I can see that I'm in the English blog, but I will be speaking Slovak because we have more Slovak native speakers, so I would like to apologize myself, but I hope the interpretation will be excellent. My presentation uh, was prepared for the people who are not uh, aware about the convention, and it is something new for them, and it emerged as uh, as a reaction uh, to the convention to uh, preserve uh, uh, natural heritage, which is uh, more known, and as far as you know, it includes many uh, monuments of natural or intangible or tangible uh, character. And the experts, uh, which are anthropologists, ethnologists, uh, have been speaking about uh, what should we do with the ethnicities which do not have such monuments, what to do with those which do not have beautiful Gothic cathedrals, at the same time, uh, having great culture and uh, therefore uh, for these uh, natural let's say ethnicities or nations which are off Europe uh, uh, what will happen to it if UNESCO takes care of them mm, the organization has the seat in Paris and I will follow my presentation uh, please uh, try remind uh, uh, try to find out when did you hear for the first time intangible living uh, heritage does it speak uh, anything to you is that a new term for you uh, 
Mm, we as ethnologists, we have been dealing with it uh, uh, for the whole 20th century and the term intangible cultural heritage is a little bit different, uh, not only in our language, but also uh, in the English language, intangible uh, heritage is something which is not tangible. Also in German uh, is uh, the si uh, a very similar word, but the experts do not like it. Uh, why should we have something negative in, uh, in the word uh, living? So in the meantime, uh, our former minister Marek Majaric uh, was fighting with this term, uh, but after this fight with the term or non-acceptance of it, we are moving to the living heritage term because it's it's basically it's living, it's life or living heritage, and we can be translating it in many different ways, and it is something that. Uh, it's not something that should not be um, used anymore. Uh, we are living it, be it speaking in the family, discussions, or uh, lullabies, or curses you use when something is not successful, or if there is a black cat running across the street. So we will be speaking about these terms. I will be speaking about three points in my presentation. Hopefully I will be in time because many times I tend to speak too much, so we will be speaking about what the intangible heritage is according to the convention, then we will be speaking about the tools UNESCO has been using from 2003, and in the last point we will be speaking about the sustainable inspirations. <laughs> <clears throat> so the first point, uh, it, the, the slide uh, doesn't look very aesthetically nice, but please focus on the red writing only. According to the definition, according to the convention, the living heritage are the practices, the representations, expressions, what do we think about, what do we do, uh, skills, tools, basically the know-how which we have, which deals with something from the past and we have been using it still, at the same time we have artifacts, items uh, connected with these um, topics. So this is something that is tangible and at the same time it is connected with the cultural environment. So if the cultural uh, environment disappears, the living heritage is then very fragile. Every time the living uh, heritage is connected to certain community or or um, even individuals. This is the only convention which basically also deals with uh, individuals. So, for example, if there uh, the 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 bell use in Slovakia was threatened, or for example, the indigo blueprint was threatened, uh, it was living only on the on the effort of an individual, and it's. Uh, uh, their enthusiasm to safeguard the heritage. Certain heritages that are in the world are also based on an individual and could disappear if the individual dies. Um, what is important to say, the important po important point is the, the follow-up from a generation to a generation, therefore the new generations need to take over these uh, traditions. And last but not least, the communities have been working on the reaction towards the environment connected to the culture and uh, the picture you can see on the slide is an application uh, of UNESCO that has been developed in 2014 and it's called Let's Emerge into the Cultural Heritage. Uh, at the UNESCO website you can find it and it will show you which is uh, which parts of cultural heritage are connected to, to another ones. And last but not least, the living uh, uh, heritage gives to the community a feeling of an identity, a feeling that it uh, goes from the generation to other generation, and also there has to be respect to the traditions. Therefore, on many places in the world, we can have different uh, items, for example, baking of bread or uh, uh, traditions using eggs, 
uh, and its illustrations, and many times it has completely different character. An important uh, point is this ethical principle, which is connected to the convention, and uh, every time we have to take into consideration that all the intangible uh, heritage needs to be in line with uh, instruments in the area of human rights. It has to respect the communities, uh, c uh, societies, and it also has to respect the natural environment. It cannot uh, uh, cannot uh, destroy the environment. For, uh, let's uh, give ourselves a couple of uh, traditions. For example, when speaking about Corrida, Corrida in Spain will never, never be defined by the convention because the bulls are tortured and uh, basically it's uh, based on the human fun. So the convention doesn't agree with this. Uh, nevertheless, the animal rights are not as supported as human rights are. These are the five domains which we have and uh, which the living uh, environment, a living uh, tradition and heritage is a part thereof. We have the uh, dancing, uh, theaters, singing, uh, community practices and rituals. My favorite part are the skills and uh, knowledge connected with the space and universe. Uh, uh, and uh, many times uh, we can see totally different uh, understanding of these topics compared to our European viewing. Mm, the last uh, thing is the know-how, which is not the product, but the know-how connected with the tradition. And we are getting to the very uh, favorite example of blueprint, of the indigo blueprint, and we need to take into consideration that is not the print using with a reverse uh, technique of printing of indigo, but it's the know-how which is behind it and which is uh, given from the generation to generation and uh, basically all the procedures how to create the paint properly and the technology thereof uh, many times it's 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 a secret and it's only given to the family members UNESCO, according to a long-term cooperation of the convention, the, uh, the UNESCO created nine groups of uh, which are being threatened. You can see it in the application, which I already mentioned. These are nine groups which are then uh, broken down, uh, and it has to do with what I've already told you at the beginning. Uh, this doesn't only uh, have to do with what our generation members think about traditions many times we have the bearers of the tradition which are aging and the new generation is not interested the living environment is also uh, not interested and many times the sense uh, is being lost the new generation doesn't understand why they should be uh, be a part of the tradition uh, now, for example, Easter traditions, there are completely different traditions and contexts which is being followed up by complete misunderstanding. Of course, cultural and global, uh, cultural globalization, the new generations are not interested in these traditions. Uh, you, uh, we don't uh, create baskets uh, from the natural materials anymore. And we are, for example, missing hay to cover the roofs. So you are unable to make a hay-based roof on our uh, houses. So we are basically missing the materials to build our houses. So we are also missing the material part, which might disappear. Uh, in connection to the crafts, uh, have you ever created something manually yourselves? Are you knitting, for example, or are you doing anything similar? So you can imagine uh, how timely, uh, time consuming it is, how much love and energy you need to give to your product, and for how much, for example, you would be uh, uh, able to sell your pro produce. So we really need. Into, we need to take into consideration that it is something else to buy uh, an item on a Chinese market or produce it yourselves. 
So just like I already mentioned, the new generation needs to be aware of what's going on and what we have at home. Uh, due to the fact that our symposium has to do with uh, sustainable development, I would like to also speak about the uh, 17 objectives of sustainability and here you can see how these particular items are interconnected. Hopefully I will have time to speak more about it. At the same time, uh, we need to speak about the sustainability, uh, which is also a very uh, substantial part of UNESCO. This has to do also with the African continent, with uh, situations Tim already mentioned, um, for example, the floods or other cataclysms, uh, Ukrainian conflict, uh, Greece has uh, a very present experience with floods, and also so this is very important for the so-called natural nations. Uh, let's speak now about uh, the tools. Mm, every uh, even year, uh, 171 countries are meeting who have ratified the convention. All of the almost all of the European countries. And uh, one question is about the USA, who uh, re returned to the UNESCO. They left UNESCO due to political reasons. I don't want to be speaking about. However, they haven't ratified. Uh, no, for example, also UK haven't ratified. They have their own uh, reasons why they are not ratifi uh, why they haven't ratified. Those countries who ratify the convention are meeting every year on a convention, on a, on a, on a, on a venue. Uh, 24, uh, mm, 24 responsible persons who are behind the steering wheel are meeting and they are dealing with very widely uh, uh, concerned uh, agenda. And we as the Slovak Republic, we are lucky that we are a part of this uh, intergovernmental committee by 2025. Therefore, uh, mm, uh, we can see how the how the templates, how to uh, safeguard uh, this tradition, should be taken care of. And also, we will be discussing the commercialization uh, and tourism. These are very uh, large threats which can uh, really threaten any cultural heritage. When speaking about the tools of the convention, uh, besides others, are four lists. We have the lists of items which need to be preserved as a priority. If, for example, there is any item with aging or already dying bearers, or, f or if there is any uh, natural cataclysm, uh, such uh, items uh, which are in jeopardy could be uh, put on such a list, which is not easy to get on that list. Therefore, from our point of view, uh, I would like to speak about the list of good practices and sharing know-how. And we uh, have uh, we have a nominee uh, of the School of Crafts, which should represent the good practices, how to give to the new generations all the traditions uh, which we have here. Uh, what is uh, a matter of interest for communities is the financial support from the fund for safeguarding of uh, cultural heritage. However, European countries are not used to uh, ask for such a contribution. However, Slovak Republic already received such a project which has to do with incorporation of Euro, uh, Ukrainian refugees which uh, uh, fled from Ukraine due to the conflict and we are using the living heritage as one of the tools how to start how to start also their resilience and the most important from the point of view of audience or the public is the list of the intangible cultural uh, heritage with uh, 676 uh, items from 140 countries. For those who like charts, you can see this on the chart. The 
uh, as you can see, it's also in English, so it's easy to understand. Uh, here you can see that only the orange part is a register of good safeguarding practices. We are trying to support these uh, practices because we, uh, we view it as the most important part. Here you can see a very beautiful pie uh, chart which shows the number of items. Uh, as you can see, Slovakia has nine items. And what do you think is the is the uh, mostly represented part? Let's try. I mean, globally, not only in Europe. A large country, many inhabitants. China, yes, indeed. China uh, is mostly represented. Spain is also highly represented. Mm, the purple part. You can see it on the left, on your left hand side, uh, Korea, I mean the South Korea, Slovakia is on a good path. When it comes to registering, of course, there are uh, way larger countries which uh, naturally have higher amounts of such items. Let me, back, let me get back uh, to what I started with. These are the registrations based on regions. Let me clarify. Number uh, one and two is Europe. Group three is the South America and Caribbean. Group number four is Asia. Group number five are uh, Arabic countries. And the last one is, sorry, vice versa, uh, Africa and Arabic countries. So the question for whom the convention was uh, basically uh, written for, 40% almost are European countries, again, which uh, basically took over the convention. And, of course, the, uh, the Secretariat is trying to deal with this situation. And the registration means an announcement for the country. You have something which is beautiful and you should register it. And therefore, uh, the given countries should receive financing for, for safeguarding of, of, of these uh, traditions. The third part, sustainable inspirations. Uh, I would like to show you items, not only items which are registered, but items which are very interesting and are and have to do with the living uh, natural environment. Mm, for example, in, Ita in Italy, they found out that the medieval uh, uh, concrete is way more uh, sustainable compared to our present materials. And the, and the scientists found out that the contents of the concrete is basically the thing uh, if uh, the rain uh, pours into the concrete makes it even harder. So what we thought was a drawback of, the, of this material, uh, it's basically their advantage. And uh, we, uh, in the present times, are trying to use these uh, procedures to make our concrete even stronger. So we th should really think about the old times and uh, also use their own uh, thoughts. Mm, uh, if you remember these nine threats to intangible uh, heritage, when it comes to the threats, one of these threats are the disappearance of the technology of knitting, uh, of old Indian materials. For the past 200 years, we haven't found out how they preserve, how they made it and how they preserved it. If you take a look at the picture, you can see these are uh, transparent uh, materials. They called it uh, knitted air. And the modern technologies are enabling us to clone these old technologies. And uh, we are trying to um, find out how to preserve this uh, technology. I only have seven last seconds. Uh, 
I would like to also speak about the technology of the Surui tribe in Brazil. They are not using the bows and arrows, and they are using mobile phones and tablets in order to uh, map illegal draining of their uh, resources. So they're trying to uh, safeguard their own natural resources. Uh, just briefly, uh, uh, protection against uh, avalanches in Switzerland uh, or my favorite Mm, my favorite and most recent uh, experience I just received from uh, Starigrad in Croatia. Uh, there was an old colony which is using a uh, building uh, technique without plaster. And this system has already been registered in 2018 to the World Heritage List. Uh, based on the convention from 1972, and this is an ideal connection because in 2018 uh, it was already registered and this construction will be renewed and we will find out hopefully how these buildings were basically built. And it has to do with many other objectives of uh, sustainable development connected with uh, the climate, food, and other challenges uh, we will be facing in the future. And this will be the last question I would like to pose. Uh, which is your favorite cultural heritage? And what do you think should be registered? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So just please keep your question in your mind and we will have a Q&A session later on. Just a technical comment. Uh, we unruly people who attend the symposium, we do not have usually the full version of our presentation. So I just like to remind you that we are going to also have a booklet from the symposium, the proceedings of the symposium, so you will get the text both in English and Slovak version. So once again, thanks to Lubica Volanska. And now I invite Dr. Pal Kovac Dora from the Intellectual Cultural Heritage Directorate, Open Air Museum of Ethnography Santander near Budapest. We have visited it several times. It's a beautiful place. Uh, so now I invite her to come to the front. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Dora Pakovac, and I work in the directorate of... Uh, Is it okay now? Yes. Yes. For me, it's better. <laughs> so, again, hi everyone. My name is uh, Dora Pakovac, and uh, I work in the directorate of uh, ICH in the Hungarian Open Air Museum in Santandra in uh, Hungary. I am ethnographer, and uh, I defended my PhD dissertation at uh, Babes Boye University in uh, Cluj Napoca in uh, Romania. My research topic of, my, of the PhD dissertation uh, was the male and the female roles uh, of the couple dance in a Transylvanian village. Today, in my presentation, I will show you the period before the ratification of the 2003 convention in Hungary. Here, I need to mention our director, uh, our name of director, Esther Csonkatakács. I think lots of you know her. Esther sends greetings to all of you. Unfortunately, he, uh, she cannot uh, attend due to other responsibilities. But she felt uh, it is an important uh, symposium with a really important topic. That's why she delegated me. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. Mm, it's okay. <laughs> so I have based this presentation uh, on her written sources and her narratives. So about this presentation. This year marks uh, the 20th anniversary of the convention, which is a good occasion to look back at what helped Hungary to join the convention and what actions were necessary after the ratification. Which institutions have defined the methods for the transmission of traditional culture? What conservation uh, strategies were in effect before the uh, convention? How did this help to implement the convention? Okay. The areas of uh, manifestation of intangible cultural heritage were made the focus of scholarly research as early as on the turn of the 20th century. In Hungary, before this uh, UNESCO convention, cultural heritage had many manifestations. Folklore and folk art developed from the 19th century with the study of folklore and folk art. Tradition still living at the time in everyday practice and its original function was documented, archived, catalogued and processed. Ethnographic collections have been readily available and popular thanks to the series of important publications and to the national uh, traditionalist movement. With the help of the scholarly and the scientific organizations, educational programs, public education networks, and civil and communities, the traditions live on with both the original and the new function as well. They reach the broadest audiences at, uh, and to this day, they have been able to contribute to the continuity of culture, to handing down knowledge, to enjoyable learning and to help heritage live on locally and even in urban settings. Some words about the scientific history about the folk music. Béla Vicar was the first in Europe to record folk songs on a phonograph in 1895. From the early 18s onwards, Béla Bartók and Zoltán Kodály launched a comprehensive and scholarly folk music collection program that extended to all Hungarian language speaking areas. This marked the beginning of academic musical folkloristics. Their results would soon contribute to international comparative folk music research. The inquiry into the originals, origins and the interrelations of culture that had been living side by side for centuries led Bartók and Kodály and their pupils to explore the folk music of the neighboring countries and even further afield. They recorded, noted down, analyzed and arranged a great many Slovakian, Romanian and Serbian melodies. Kodály researched a Finno-Ugorian peoples Bartok performed exemplary seminar work in collecting folk music in Algeria and in Turkey as well. Laszlo Laita, one of the prominents of the founding of the UNESCO's International Folk Music Council, what is nowadays ICTMD, uh, produced many important monographs on the instrumental folk music. Bartok, Kodai, and their followers created a considerable archive even by European standards, with over uh, 200,000 uh, 200, melodies arranged according to Bartók's catalog order. Béla Bartók, Zoltán Kodály, and László Lajta dipped into the pure source that is folk music for their world famous compositional oeuvre. The development of a musical vernacular uh, from early childhood onwards in the framework of uh, musical education in schools has become a known and applied practice around the world as the Kodai concept, which was selected to the Good Safeguarding Practices Register in 2016. Uh, some details about uh, scientific history about the folk dance. The systematic collection of folk dances began in the entire Hungarian language area too, among ethnicities in Hungary 
and in the neighboring countries. George Martin was among the first to document dance processes on film. Martin and his followers revived the Hungarian dance dialect and their links to European dance culture. The Hungarian-born Rudolf Laban developed a system of notation for dance similar to musical notation called Laban notation or kinetography Laban with which every movement in the dance can be described and analyzed. In addition to early research in folk music, dance, and uh, customs in Hungary, systematic investigation in folk architecture and craftsmanship have all contributed to the immense and continuously growing archives of uh, intangible and, tan and tangible cultural heritage. In the 1930s, a village research movement emerged using mainly sociographic methods. Concurrently with scholarly effort, the need arose for the widespread promo uh, promotion of the living and available knowledge of traditional communities with a view to revival. In an effort to present folk culture in urban environment, as early as the 30s, uh, uh, the so-called Gyöngyös Bokréta folk groups would travel from the villages to Budapest to perform music and dance on the stage. Growing into a movement, they contributed to preserving local traditions, uh, so customs, dance, music, uh, costumes, and uh, craftsmanship as well. They are now, uh, there are now several traditional groups in the country uh, that continue to function on a continuous basis to this dance. Launched uh, in the 60s, the televised folk music competition Fly Peacock presented the most gifted advo advocates of uh, folk heritage as role models and proved the large numbers of young people had an interest in folk uh, culture. Some people sang in front of the television screens and scores a new folk traditionalist groups, bands, and dance companies. The community cohesive force of uh, tradition, folk music, and folk dance made a comeback uh, with new functions. As a continuation of this, the television talent show or competition, uh, Reason the Peacock, was uh, produced from 2012 to 2019. The burgeoning need uh, for personally uh, experiencing tradition and making it a way of life was largely due to the concept of dance house movement. Drawing uh, from the pure source was the result of uh, active participation on the part of the communities, which abandoned pass uh, passivity for new personal functions. Knowledge and practice acquired through personal experience attracted hundreds of thousands of young uh, city and uh, country people to folk culture. Today, when the dance house movement is uh, moreover 50 years old, folk dance, folk music, and craftsmanship are practiced across generations. The conscious uh, use of the early research and collections, the performance practices learned from uh, informants, and relying on educational and, uh, and institutional network of uh, public education, the so-called dance has, dance house method, was selected to the register of good safeguarding practices in 2011 as being a Hungarian model of safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. Hungary was among the first countries internationally to recognize the understanding representatives of communities preserving ICH. Under the scene, not unlike the Living Human Treasures program, the Hungarian National Prize over this of the Master of Folk Art has gone to over 60 uh, members since uh, 53. The best young talents uh, have been awarded the Young Master of Folk Art Prize. The Folk Art uh, Craftsmanship Award Applied Folk Artist goes to the best in their field. Okay, sorry. 
After the movement, I would like to say some details about the institution which uh, deal with the traditional culture. Part of the national network of uh, history scholarly institution is the Hungarian Academy of Sciences Institute for Musicology, representing Hungarian public collection in the, muse in the Museum of uh, Ethnography with the G digital archive of uh, ethnographic films and the Hungarian Open Air Museum and the Hungarian Heritage House. The last one was created for the preservation of uh, living folk art, uh, which also functions as a service center, helping the survival, educational, uh, presentation of intangible cultural heritage, making the, the sources available, and the transmission of good practices. If we look back to the second half of the 20th century, two major processes were observed worldwide. One was the processes of globalization, the development of technology, and the other was the increasing value of local culture and traditions. Therefore, it is no co coincidence that UNESCO has declared the importance of folklore and intangible cultural goods, their protection and promotion. Following this aim, it was called for the establishment of an interna international European Folklore Center in Budapest. During the UNESCO Cultural Forum was held in Hungary in uh, 86. After many years of preparatory work, the European Center for Traditional Culture was established in Hungary, which later continued its work under the name European Folklore Institute. The question may arise, what could be the role of such an international or European folklore center? Assistance and services to all nations, groups, and individuals in Europe, to cover all, fi uh, all fields and traditional culture, emphasizes, of course, the ICH, to create a database, to bring together the most active people in the field of folklore, building on the results of uh, scientific research to, pre, uh, to present the timeless value of folklore. Before and after the established convention, stakeholders want to take equal, want, want not to take equal between folklore, traditional culture, and the heritage. They try to understand the convention and the UNESCO's aim the basic point is the community, which is more wider than the communities in the traditional culture. And then, in 2003, UNESCO accepted the ICH Convention and Hungary ratified it in three years later. Thus, the UNESCO Convention became a, pro a program in Hungary in, in, in a situation where organizations and mechanisms already existed at different levels and in different forms of organization, dealing with or uh, representing different aspects of the intangible cultural heritage. The, the task, therefore, was to build on the background to establish a coherent system and mechanism. And what has happened after 2003, it's another story. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dora. Uh, we are compatible with Hungary because we ratified on 2006 also. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Before we proceed with the next presentation, which will be online, and Dr. Martin Reeves from the UK will speak to us, uh, two short comments when it comes to the context of the presentation he will be speaking about. The UK is not a member of the convention uh, in order to safeguard the heritage. Uh, on the other hand, the topic he will be speaking about has to do with uh, puppet shows in uh, uh, the 
UK or he was became a Panjan Jodi show which Judy show which is a, a comed comedy which is a living tradition for hundreds of years so I'm very happy that Dr. Reeve uh, accepted our invitation because uh, we will see uh, we in the post-communist countries we also view uh, the safeguarding of traditions through institutions and in UK maybe you've experienced it I've experienced it I have been uh, participating on such venues for many times we have there is a real a huge tradition of this uh, puppet show uh, Indonesia for example Sri Lanka Egypt uh, Italy and uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia as well. Uh, this is really very vivid. So, dear Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, we can hear you. I'm going to assume that you can hear me. And um, I think uh, you're I just introduced me. So, I'm Dr. Martin Reeve. I'm a freelance actor, documentary maker, researcher, and ethnographer. In fact, my ethnography was an ethnography of Punch and Judy performance, which I did for Royal Holloway College at the University of London. And it's a great shame, I have to say, that I can't be there with you in person, enjoy your good company and your fine beer. And I have very many happy memories of visiting Banska Bistrica some years ago um, at a couple of festivals organized by Yore, some puppet festivals. So I hope one day to be back there. I'm going to be talking about uh, Punch and Judy, and I'm going to be talking about the relationship between tradition and organization. In 2001, a set of postage stamps displaying pictures of characters from the traditional glove puppet show Punch and Judy was produced by the Royal Mail, Britain's then nationalised postal service. Punch and Judy performers were very keen to do a show at the launch event of these stamps, but they were not allowed to, because it was felt that the show might offend people. So this story tells us something about the place that Punch and Judy occupies in the cultural landscape in Britain in the 21st century. And it helps us to think about what the bearers of the tradition are having to do to ensure its survival. It needs to be clear from the outset uh, that Punch and, Judy, uh, Punch and Judy is not on the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage, nor at the moment could it be considered to be endangered as a tradition. But it's an important tradition and perhaps one day it will be on that list. Punch and Judy is familiar to almost everyone in Britain. And it's one of a number of traditional European puppet shows which have much in common, but have particular characteristics deriving from their country or region. For example, in Italy, particularly Naples, Pulcinella. In France, Polichinelle. In Germany, Casper. In Holland, Jan Klaassen. In Portugal, Dom Roberto. In Slovakia, Gasparco. In Russia, Petrushka, and so on. Some of the shows, including Punch, have the same historical route, Pulcinella, from the Italian Commedia dell'arte. Performers of Punch and Judy are far more numerous than those of the other national puppet traditions, numbering in the hundreds compared with at most dozens. This abundance of performers has a bearing on the vitality of the tradition, naturally, and it's not a fragile form in need of official protection. Indeed, indeed performers would probably resent and rebel against such protection if it were offered. It's a show which belongs very much to the performers. And because of this, performers don't feel bound to perform the show in a prescribed way. Nonetheless, there are some basic elements without which the show could not be called a Punch and Judy show. One performer described it to me as being like a popular song interpreted by different singers. The words in the tune are more or less the same, but the arrangement changes from performer to performer. And the interplay between individual performer and the tradition is what gives the show its vigor and its interest. The basic components of the show, which define it as a Punch and Judy show, may be reduced to the following three things. First of all, the dramaturgy. 
The show itself is performed in a brightly coloured, usually striped red and white booth, in which the puppeteer stands, unseen by the audience, holding the glove puppets behind a proscenium arch. Secondly, the plot. The basic plot is very simple, and it's always the same. Mr Punch is left to look after his baby by his wife, Judy. He becomes irritated by the baby's crying, and he kills it. Judy returns and discovers what has happened. Punch and Judy fight, and Punch kills Judy. Judy is arrested, but escapes punishment by killing either a policeman, a hangman, the devil, or all of them. Then there's a general celebration. The essential theme of the show is Punch's rebellion against domestic responsibility. And the plot of the show came about when marital laws and expectations were becoming more and more strict in Britain. And the third characteristic is the character of Mr. Punch. Punch is a grotesque. He has a humpback, a large hooked nose, a fat belly, and a piercing voice made with the use of a swazzle or a voice modifier. He is also a rule breaker, seeking only his own satisfaction. And we might think of a contemporary example of Mr. Punch in the form of um, our recent Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. He has many of uh, Punch's characteristics. Beyond these three elements, performers have a lot of freedom to perform the show in whatever way they want. And differences between performers are expressed largely in two ways. Firstly, through the content of the show, the addition of other characters and routines, depending on the performer's taste and skill. And secondly, through the relationship to the audience. Performers may choose to remain hidden from the audience, staying inside the booth, or they may engage directly with the audience, for example, by doing balloon modelling or magic as a warm-up to the show itself. Historically, performers' income was extremely precarious, and it came from collecting money directly from the audience. Performers would adapt what they were doing, making the show longer or shorter, and including different routines or characters to maximise potential income. The show has always followed the crowds. In other words, it's always followed the money. And in the second half of the 19th century, it moved from its original location, the urban streets, to the beaches, when, as a result of the expansion of the railways, the seaside became a popular holiday destination. Although the beach show still exists, the availability of cheap foreign holidays meant that beach audiences became less numerous and performers looked for opportunities elsewhere. Shows came to rely more and more on advanced bookings from more organised events such as festivals, country fairs and fates, school educational projects, museum exhibitions and so on. The effect of this was that the show came to rely increasingly on its appeal to a sense of nostalgia. And although this did not materially affect the contents of the show, it did affect how the show was perceived and advertised and the places where it would find a receptive audience. It also meant that performers began to think about the idea of tradition and what this meant in defining what a Punch and Judy show is a question which had not really been articulated before. In parallel with this sense of traditionalization and helping to drive it, was an increasing ability for, uh, for performers to meet and exchange ideas. Initially, this exchange of ideas, comparing puppets, routines, and so on, would happen around the one or two shops that sold Punch and Judy puppets. As early as 1955, Oscar Oswald, who ran a shop selling magic equipment and Punch and Judy equipment, formed the Association of Punch Workers. As one former member of the association put it to me, this was the first attempt to gather opinions and create a sense of fraternity. The ability to meet and exchange ideas gained real traction in the 1970s with the establishment of the annual Mayfair in London's Covent Garden. Although it was billed as a puppet festival, it has largely been taken over by Punch and Judy performers who gather in the gardens behind St Paul's Church and Covent Garden to put on shows. This has become an extremely important date in the calendar for performers, and it continues today. 
Out of these meetings and conversations grew a sense that performers wanted to do something to celebrate and protect their tradition. And two important organisations were formed. The first of these was the Punch and Judy Fellowship, the PJF, which came into being in 1985. Its founding principle was, to quote its constitution, to guarantee the survival and traditions of our national puppet. It has over 100 members, full members and associate members. Full members are all performers and have to undergo an audition to qualify. Non-performers can become associate members. The PGF has organised a number of its own annual Punch and Judy festivals, which have run for several years. It has a constitution, the annual gen an annual general meeting, and a magazine called The Swazzle. The other influential organisation is the Punch and Judy College of Professors. This came into being shortly after the PJF, and its driving force were two influential punch performers, Glyn Edwards and John Stiles. Edwards, a former TV producer in particular, felt that the PJF was too inward looking, and he wanted an organisation that could speak forcibly to the outside world on behalf of the tradition. Edwards was particularly concerned about what he saw as attacks on the tradition in the press. Attacks to do with the perceived violence in the show. Articles had begun to appear in the media that suggested that the show had had its day, and that its apparent celebration of infanticide and wife-beating, albeit in puppet form, were no longer acceptable. Edwards wanted to make sure, as he put it to me once, that the tradition survived into the 21st century, and the college was a means to do this. Membership of the college was by invitation only, and it invited what it considered to be the most skilled performers. At its height, it had a membership of 19 or 20. Many college members were also PJF members. The college also sought to actively promote the tradition as part of a broader international tradition of popular puppetry, and it organised a number of festivals in Britain, where puppeteers from abroad were invited to perform. Members of the college also performed at puppet festivals abroad, including in Slovakia. Whilst Edwards was certainly keen on situating Punch and Judy amongst a set of international cognates, and in so doing add weight to his argument that it should be taken seriously as a traditional form, his motives were mixed. He saw the setting up of international festivals as a way of getting English Arts Council funding for a tradition which, because of ambivalence about its content, might not otherwise attract it. He once described these festivals to me as Trojan horses, getting Punch and Judy in under a disguise. Edwards was also instrumental in getting funding to research the tradition at PhD level, a collaborative doctoral award between Royal Holloway College and the Punch and Judy College of Professors. And this research may well have been another means to give the show a degree of legitimacy. And as I've said, I was the recipient of that PhD award, and that's why I'm speaking to you today. The ambivalence with which the show has come to be received in Britain may signal a more general and confused response to the past. We love the symbols of the past, but we do not always love what those symbols represent. Britain has become a far more multicultural place in the past few decades. New power relations between the sexes are in play, as are more modern ways of dealing with children. Performers are negotiating these new sets of relations and what they mean for the tradition. The ability to meet, to exchange ideas and organise has made this negotiation a collective enterprise. And this is the group speaking on behalf of the individual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. It was very interesting yeah. once again that uh, because uh, uh, the United Kingdom is not a member of the uh, mm. convention, so it was really, really interesting for us. Moreover, you know that I know very well this tradition from the, our sessions in Covent Garden, etc. I do.
So, uh, máme teraz uh, trošku, sme si ušetrili času, aby sme si to nenazerali. Uh, we saved some time, so we don't have it only at the very end. So let's open a Q&A session uh, for those uh, contributions which we just heard now. And so if you have any questions on the previous speakers, please do so. Kolega Mirohan, ak má mikrofón, ak sa chcete na niečo spýtať. No. Uh, so do you want to ask also Martin? Uh, then you can ask him. He's still online. You are good kids. You are not asking any questions. Okay. Or is there a question? Well, I always have a question. I have a question for Dora. Uh, and for Martin, just a comment, mm. maybe. Or maybe I start with Martin. That it, um, It's interesting how... I don't see you, so it's a kind of complicated. Okay. Uh, that uh, I think it's interesting that uh, that how many players you have in different playgrounds. So Great Britain doesn't complicate uh, the situation with being also a part of the UNESCO structures and the Convention 2003, because what what you said that was going on on the national level is even more complicated on the international level. So can you imagine Great Britain? in the future joining the convention? Well, it, that's an interesting comment because I spoke to Glyn Edwards, who I mentioned just then, about uh, UNESCO and the um, uh, intangible cultural heritage, how you might be, get on that list. And he said to me, the bureaucracy would be very difficult. And for that reason, and also because there's a sense that the protection does, the, the in tradition uh, doesn't feel in need of representing apart from from within itself, uh, there was a sense that, that they weren't going to apply for that. Yeah, it's the, always the question of choice, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Martin, yeah, by absolutely. the way, Martin, by the way, to the terminology, when I first I said to our friend, to Clive and and you that I'm working also for the UNESCO mm. for uh, intangible cultural heritage, mm. nobody from native speakers. <laughs> understand what it means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keď som prvýklad angličanom povedal, že teda robíme nehmotné kultúrne dedičstvo, tak nikto z angličanov nerozumel tomu pojmu. It's only joke. It's only international yeah. English. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's for international English. Yes, but I would like to give English. Uh, to you. Takže kľudne sa pýtajte. Máme tu tlmočníkov skvelých, takže... You can ask questions because we have interpretation. Okay, Dora, so if maybe you can think about the question. Um, I was wondering, that was really interesting because you can see how, how similar the situation is in the post socialist countries or during the socialist period, that we had a similar ways, probably also in Slovenia, how to deal with uh, the traditional culture, that we have these this master's programs and, and uh, the, you have the Peacock, the Czech Republic has also the master program. We have something similar in, in our um, Center for Folk Art Production. Uh, and how I was wondering how this is um, perceived by the communities and maybe a second question connected to this uh, is related to the times after ratifying uh, the convention by Hungary, how the two um, lists, I mean the list that is produced in Santendre on the UNESCO level, on the national level, and the list of Hungarikums uh, play together and what's the relationship the, between these two lists because it's kind of contradictory maybe and yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know which place is the best for me. Uh, actually, uh, the communities uh, now use the, the archives and now use the documentation uh, in this, um, for example, the Institute of uh, Musicology. There, there are a lot of uh, materials of uh, dance and music recordings and uh, the communities use these uh, recordings because um, Lots of uh, communities in uh, our country, uh, unfortunately, um, now don't know uh, what was the dances and what, uh, what were the, the music tradition, for example, in the beginning of the 20th century or the, the first part of the 20th century. And uh, nowadays, uh, they usually use 
the uh, materials on these archives. So, so now we have a really uh, strong connection uh, with the communities, um, helping uh, helping the communities uh, to um, to gain uh, some knowledge about their own uh, tradition. And the second question. Uh, more complicated for me. Um, actually, uh, you know, this uh, UNESCO ICH convention is an international uh, level, and the uh, other system is uh, uh, a Hungarian, uh, just a, a national uh, list for um, for register to um, to traditions to to um, because of, to customs and uh, some. Um, some customs uh, from Hungary. Um, the, the process of the documentation is uh, different than the UNESCO's, but there are some uh, connection uh, uh, between these two register. But uh, maybe during the coffee break, I can make <laughs> some longer answer <laughs> because it's not, uh, not so easy. So thank you very much for your comments, uh, and we will continue with our friend and colleague, uh, Spela Spanzel. Uh, Špela is from the Cultural Heritage Directorate of the Ministry of Culture of Slovenia, so welcome. Uh, sh this is not first visit for her. Uh, last uh, time it was uh, the nomination of the Lipitan breed, and we have met uh, either in uh, Slovenia or also in Austria. Spela, please. Hvala lepa. Um, hvala za povabilo. Hvala spoštovani kolegi, prijatelji. Lepo je biti tukaj. This was just a little test if I make do it in, <laughs> in Slovene language, but apparently not, so I'm switching to English. So, uh, thank you very much. If the timer is not working, then I will need to have the, the uh, just that I don't fly away. Uh, otherwise, maybe I'll, I'll just take the, okay. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I received the invitation from my dear colleague and friend Juraj, uh, I, was, I was very, very pleased to come again. Uh, but then you will understand that uh, something happened uh, in, in Slovenia that totally changed my perspective. So I still haven't had the time to really shift my presentation entirely. So I'm just uh, taking it as we go. Maybe it's a little bit of an overview. Uh, and then I'll, I'll emphasize one point which I think it's important and that will also uh, sort of come back to what, uh, to what uh, Luba was saying in the beginning. Uh, so I, I sort of titled my, uh, my uh, presentation for the well-being of communities because I think this is maybe the single most important point of the convention for non-specialists. I'm not a specialist, I'm an art historian. So my heart first really belonged to the World Heritage Convention. So this is my per perspective that through working on this uh, ICH convention, uh, that really taught us a lot of things, also personally, not only in terms of knowledge and, you know, and the, uh, appreciation. Uh, this is what we usually single out as being uh, very important in terms also when we speak about the living heritage. And I have to say that uh, after, the, uh, after the ratification of the convention, also in our law for cultural heritage, we had this term of living heritage. Uh, like uh, Luba and like you were saying, that we often dis di discuss it. But then we changed it to this intangible because it's more in line with the, with the uh, international standard setting document as the, the convention is. So now I'll try to go on. Okay. 
So I'm just sort of framing it, and, and we didn't complement it with, with, with Luba, but I see that we are going there. So intangible heritage is actually part, uh, part of a lot of international standard setting documents, so the con conventions and programs. Of course, the, the two most known uh, UNESCO um, conventions and the lists, which were not intended to be bigger than the convention, to be honest. But it's also part of the cultural roots program of the Council of Europe, a very nice program that actually connects uh, uh, heritage and communities and management and pedagogic activities and tourism, of course, and the European Heritage Label, which actually talks about the common European uh, values that are many times enshrined also in the intangible element. Uh, so it was uh, in, uh, so last year we had the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, which was also a very big thing because it's a global, most, let's say, universal instrument. It has more states parties than, than UNESCO, the members. But uh, the 2003 convention, as we call it, is really approaching this, let's say, universality very, very quickly. I, I don't know the, the number of the ratifying states because it recently changed. 71, see? 171. Yes, 171, yes. So we, are, so we are nearly getting there. So even with our inscriptions on the World Heritage List, there is a part of, let's say, intangible di dimension. And if you know this convention, the World Heritage Convention, convention there is a cri criteria number six that actually talks about, let's say, the intangible, the sim symbolic, and so on. But of course, it's applied to the physical space. So this, this is main, the main uh, difference. So why we talk, why we, when we talk about the 2003 convention, we talk about the relationship between people and heritage. We talk about our own people to people re relationship. And we talk about what heritage means to society. And this is all what this community term really stands for. So why, why it's also very important and why I often use the intangible uh, heritage is because it also connects immovable and movable heritage because intangible elements are often, are often uh, connected to the physical spaces, be it where something is ex expressed, let's say, uh, to movable heritage, there are a lot of objects that are used with the, with the intangible heritage, but the, this is not the point, as we say. And the landscape, of course, you know, the, the nature, environments, and so on. So uh, it's, it's sort of uh, funny or very telling because the intangible convention, it's all about transmission and so the education, but sometimes, I don't know if it's in the other countries, you know, sometimes the educational system might not be the kindest to the intangible heritage and sometimes also us, the governmental services, have a bit of uh, difficulties uh, co connecting. Of course, it's important for the, for the national and international cooperation and what we really emphasize always is the social relevance. So it's not that the intangible heritage is, is important per se, but because of what it, it means to its bearers, as we call them, the individuals, groups, and the societies, and why these this tra traditions are also relevant today. When, when we live in a totally different way, with iPad, with I don't know what. So why, why, why is still this need that we have to, to, to produce something or to make something or to, or to use our time in these cultural uh, ways? So uh, this is how we, we do it in, in Slovenia. We have uh, the so-called coordinator for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage, which, which is the Slovene Ethnographic Museum. We have the register, uh, which is uh, recording not only the elements, but also the bearers. 
And this has, this has developed in such a way that uh, now we have a lot of groups and individuals that are joining the already inscribed elements, the already registered elements, and this is like an incentive how, how this uh, awareness raising, if you want, this horrible world, word, how this, how this is going on. So a lot of the co communities and, and so society as such is becoming aware of it because of, uh, because of the bearers are joining in. Uh, so we first started to also to have the monument. So these are the uh, intangible heritage of national significance, but then we figured out that this was not really a good parallel. So what is, what is, what is the one to be sort of lifted up from all the other registered elements? For us, this was UNESCO, so it was a sort of a, a singling out what is also important internationally, but of course this in some ways doesn't really go well with the convention. So you see, so far we have 115 inscribed uh, registered elements. Three are in the pipeline that are very close to my heart. Uh, one is, uh, let's say, uh, partisan songs, because this is something that is still very much living. One is sort of jazz, popular music, jazz improvisation and Slo Slovenian uh, songs. And one is again in the in the in, in the sphere of oral traditions, and I'm telling you that because we have, as you see, a lot, a lot, a lot, and this is what usually people understand as intangible cultural heritage. There is a lot of, let's say, um, craftsmanship. This is something that is quite predominant. While while we would really like to sort of shift the focus towards the knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe that was also mentioned because we are not aware that this is also a part of the whole of the whole system uh, but of course the ethical principles were already mentioned we are very very much uh, strict about that so we are really uh, acting upon the incentive uh, from the from from the field, we 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 sort of never say it. You know, you are, you deserve it because if they don't recognize that what they are doing is actually the intangible heritage is something that is special, that is some cultural practice, then 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 it can't be it. Uh, we also, uh, our register is also geo-referenced, so this is also helping us to sort of put it on the map, if you want. So this was, this was done uh, after we did a major EU-funded project, so it's also the intangible heritage is sort of referenced on the map, and this also helps with the visibility. And this is how, let's say, some of the in inscriptions look like. There, there are short, uh, sh uh, short descriptions, there are links, there are maps, and so on. Uh, so these are some of the examples that I ask my colleagues to, to put forward. Um, and this is uh, what, what we did so far this year, and I have some copies here of our uh, pub publication on, on the register. There was also a big, uh, big get-together, uh, the Congress, uh, the LACE Congress in Nova Gorica. Um, but I wanted to, first I wanted to talk about the beekeeping because this is an element that is very well known and it actually talks about a lot of the issues that, that we're dealing with. Um, and I wanted to explain why we, why we decided to put, uh, to, to put up a national no nomination. And this is because you see uh, there, there are several, uh, several entries in our re register, so the, uh, so the uh, diapason of practices really goes, so it's in the oral tra tradition, it's tra traditional art, so there's a lot of this. Uh, and it's also very con contemporary, let's say, with epitherapy now. Uh, these are the, the, the mains under the con convention that, that it covers. 
when we started working with the beekeepers, it was all about the past, the big uh, names of the past, you know, the male beekeepers that actually, you know, did the whole story and the history and, you know, Austro-Hungarian Empire and how it went on. But of course, we really uh, emphasize these social practices. Uh, and of course, a lot of the, let's say, of the practices that they didn't even con consider to be worth mentioning. One is uh, beekeeping for disabled people, uh, innovation in beehives and so on. So there are a lot of uh, practices that actually correspond to the sustainable development goals. And we really emphasize the life on land, the uh, SDG 15. Uh, while the beekeepers usually talk about, especially now, let's say, food, sa food, food safety, which is then uh, uh, connected also to good health and well-being. So I'm sort of taking the same slides from the ICH uh, website just to invite you to take a look at it because it's really interactive. You can see how it, uh, how it connects. And this was probably the biggest festive event that was co connected to, uh, to ICH when we handed over the cer certificate, the original cer uh, certificate uh, of, of the inscription and also we made 115 copies or facsimile. So the, the local beekeepers uh, society came and this was really a source of proudness and it was a true festival event. So it was a celebration of communities. And then I wanted to talk about the Lipis and Horse Breeding Tradition because this is the project that we did to, together. A beautiful one, a complex one, <laughs> a very, very complex one. And not only for historical and political reasons, but also because we really wanted to emphasize the content that is relevant under the convention rather, to talk, rather than talk about husbandry, rather to, to, to talk about animals, the infrastructure, the architecture and so on, and, and to make it really relevant also for the future. So if you have time, maybe you can take a look at it. I think it's a beautiful film also that we did to, together, so we are very proud of it. So as you see the, the countries here and you understand how the, how the historical connection and how, uh, how we actually came together to talk about this common heritage, as we, as we say. So these again are the domain, domains under the convention, so it's much more again than the uh, animal training. It's a lot about social practices that are maybe not so uh, evident also to people who practice it. And again, this chart that really shows you how the SDGs are then uh, connected and how the, uh, this emphasis on the environment, not, not only because it's the picturesque you know, landscapes and how the Lipis and Horse uh, actually got the name from Lipa, which is a linden tree. So this is why this picture there. But, but it has to do a lot about uh, our relationship to animals, to environment, so the planet, the, this do, domain that we were talking about. So this is what we are probably, uh, this is the situation or let's say the, the probably one of the future focuses of the convention. Um, I don't know if, if you've heard, but we had a terrible flooding event, a terrible flooding incident in, in, in Slovenia. Uh, three quarters of the country were flooded and a lot of the, let's say, the bearers were affected as well. So let's say that uh, we, are, we, are, we, we are accustomed to record damage from weather conditions that is, let's say, uh, uh, that is to immovable heritage. So we know how to record damage in buildings, uh, in the landscape, to the, to the museum, to the archives ma materials. We are very much accustomed to do that. But how to respond that in terms of living heritage and the bearers? 
So we immediately turn to, uh, to, to, to them, ask them if they were affected in terms, again, of physical damage. So if their quarter of, of if their homes were affected, if their, I don't know, community centers where they, where they meet were affected. But we cannot actually calculate, because we need to calculate, of course, in this, you know, uh, evidence-based world, you, you need to calculate what is the damage. What, what does it cost then in euros to come back to the previous state? Uh, so this is a huge challenge for us. Only to, today we have the deadline to prepare our, our uh, estimate for the Solidarity Fund for the EU, and you know how, it, how, how this is done then. But how, again, to record that, what intangible heritage means to the communities, how they will be able to re recover let's say, in, in, in these expressions where they're doing in the physical spaces, how, let's say, the 800 people that are, that are part of the Shkofio Loka Passion Play, our first inscription, will be able to participate the whole year to prepare for the big Passion Play per performance that takes place in five years. Probably not, because the Polianska Valley was one of the most affected. So we have already been approached and asked, how can we help them? Can they postpone it for a year? Is that feasible? Costumes are safe, their, their, their objects are safe, but will people have the energy to actually to devote their, their time if they have to rebuild their, their houses? So these are a lot of practical questions that we are that we are dealing with. We don't think that there is a system uh, in place, or at least we don't have that experience as much as we have, let's say, with physical damage, as I've said. So I think that this will also be quite a discussion, maybe on the European level, because now Spain, Greece, you know. The climate crisis is really taking its toll, and it's not a hundred year event, but it's maybe two or three years now. So this is what I wa wanted to, to sort of pose as a, as a challenge for the future, and rather to have an answer to it. Um, so again, ICH for us, it's a celebration of the bearers and communities, and this is something that we would really like to insist on. My time's up. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Spela, and uh, we really strongly appreciate that you take a, that you joined our symposium. Because when we were speaking together with Spela, we were discussed uh, actually the symposium, but there were the floods back then. And uh, she said that everything other is more important uh, than a symposium. Uh, we are having additional participants, hopefully online, because we will be speaking with our Lithuanian colleague. I would like to ask our uh, colleague, Milda Valichewskie, from the uh, Lithuanian Ministry of Culture, uh, to start her presentation. Hopefully we are connected and we can see each other. Yes, it's okay, we are, yes. Take a floor. So, dobry dienny. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, sorry if I, I did not uh, pronounce well in Slovak, uh, so I speak also to English. So uh, thank you very much, dear Juraj Jura and uh, Lubica, for a very kind invitation to take part in, in this event, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the UNESCO Convention. Uh, this convention which makes a huge impact in strengthening communities and empowering them. Of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a pity that I cannot attend uh, physically uh, this, uh, this event uh, to, to meet you, everyone, and, and, and you, Uri, Lubisa, and Stella, and others. 
but uh, I will try to, to, to present um, uh, my presentation from distance. And uh, as I understand, you will help me with a slideshow, isn't it? Uh, maybe you could you could display then the first the first slide. Thank you very much. So uh, in my brief presentation, I will try to give a very general look into the uh, pre-conventional conventional context of the national legislation related to traditional culture in Lithuania since 90s. Um, and until the convention time, 2003, and also I will question whether we can really consider it as a pre-conventional context of the past, or maybe we are still in the same pot. If not, my question is whether these, from one side, uh, past folkloristic local and national approaches and from another side, global concept of ice age are compatible between them. Uh, then I will briefly present the mostly most noticeable results of the impact of the convention, international inscriptions and national inventory in Lithuania, giving some examples of working methods of the inventory and some maybe good practices of regional cooperation. So uh, the next slide, please. So to start, I would remind that in the epoch of the national independence movement in the 90s, uh, the field of traditional culture, folklore, folk culture, was uh, of crucial importance in Lithuania and maybe also in the whole region. It was in a way a continuation of interwar processes of self-constructing and self-defining as ethnocultural nations. And it was characteristic to the most of states of Eastern Europe, uh, uh, based on romantic interpretation of folklore, ethnicity, language, history, and mythology. So the main act of national legislation in the field of traditional culture, uh, folklore, folk culture, in Lithuania was mostly influenced by ethnocentric approach. Therefore, as you see uh, one extract of, the, of our main law, we have still this double-edged and quite ambiguous notion of the nation, of the definition uh, of, the, of the field in general, and, and in this definition, uh, the, the very important uh, notion of the nation in the law, mentioning ethnos in the brackets. In fact, it's meaning the titular ethnos, uh, like uh, Lithuanians, and it, it contradicts uh, to the open meaning of the nation as it, as it is. So, the next step, slide, please. We also have another law, uh, national law, we had it in 2007, uh, focused on the products uh, and stimulation of the craftsman. Uh, which has, of course, its advantages uh, in itself, together with a very strict system of control of ethnicity criteria, duration of a tradition, etc. This law um, regulates the system of certification of the products of national heritage and the data base. It also has its kind of inventory or register. And in practice, besides the general aims of uh, stimulating, stimulating crafts, the law acts via a system named, named a classificator, consisting of number of quite tight requirements, limitations and specifications about the technologies and shapes to be used for producing authentic types, authentic types of products uh, of national heritage. And the next slide, please. So, in 2004, uh, Lithuania was among the first nine countries to ratify the Convention, and such an Im immediate ratification uh, would presuppose that the notion and the co concept of Ice Age, intangible cultural heritage, has been inherently and entirely recognized by the society in Lithuania, uh, in, in Lithuania and its heritage preservation system. But in fact, maybe not publicly, but in various inner uh, contexts, 
it was revealed some dissonance in understanding traditional culture as I see it, considering UNESCO approach, approach as, in a way, outlandish, somehow imported, maybe even too cosmopolitical uh, paradigm, bringing a new terminology uh, in, uh, in, in comparison with the previously rooted system of Lithuanian ethnic culture. The next slide, slide please. And in reality, uh, these two parallel approaches uh, still do exist. And it is supported from one side by the National Legal Act and the lively, lively paradigm of folklore, and uh, from regulated, uh, regulated by Global Legal Act. Act. The, and another, from another side, it's uh, supported by the UNESCO Convention. And both two parallel approaches still keep functioning, fun functioning opposing to themselves and very often focusing on the same elements uh, and um, trying to, to um, sometimes to achieve the, the, main, the main aim. The next slide, please. So coming back uh, to the impact uh, or results of the convention, some numbers and facts. So we have three inscriptions on the representative list. Uh, then we had a very long, we had a very long pause, almost 13 years uh, after 2010 uh, until now, and it was uh, related, maybe probably, to a very long drawn process of the inventory establishing. Um, as a very first draft concept of inventory uh, was focused mainly on folklore. Uh, the extinct traditions or even archival documenting approach. But this approach was finally withdrawn. So the first inscriptions uh, reflect uh, the most uh, emblematic understanding of national cultural heritage. Uh, the, con the convention uh, for the state uh, being a tool bringing the most important national symbols on the international stage uh, and offering an easy source of uh, cultural tourism for the international and diplomatic representation. The next slide, please. So uh, we had uh, uh, about these uh, three first inscriptions. So we have the tradition of making and visiting abundantly carved wooden crosses in various memory spaces and sacral locations. The tra tradition which was a symbol of culture in the interwar period. Then we had uh, song and dance celebrations, uh, multinational nomination, a tradition of massive singing and dancing, which was originated from the interwar period, but um, mainly strongly developed and supported by socialist ideology as well. And thirdly, thir the third uh, inscription was Sutartinus, uh, multi-part singing, uh, uh, a revived tradition uh, in some, at some time, at some period of time, almost extinct and revitalized by the folklore movement in 80s and famous by its archaic form. And finally, we are waiting for the next inscription, so after 13 years, uh, which will happen hopefully this year in Botswana. Uh, it is a craft, uh, straw garden making, straw decoration uh, making. And this first uh, eventual inscription uh, of this element in really was uh, first, for the first time initiated by the communities themselves, uh, which uh, who gathered in a strong association, NGO of practitioners, and this time, the process of the nomination, uh, uh, preparing, etc., uh, this time it's not initiated by the states, it, uh, it was initiated by the communities and uh, with a very strong participation of communities. So we uh, really hope that it will succeed. Uh, the next slide, please. 
And I think that this change of attitude when communities uh, take uh, a big, a more, more active part in, in the whole process, I think it was uh, resulted because um, uh, of this, uh, of the establishment of the inventory and the whole process uh, of, of its developing. Uh, it has, uh, in, in the beginning, it was, has been established in a quite, uh, as a quite sophisticated informational system, a uh, regulated database, uh, but with time, thanks to the efforts of the main administrator, the Lithuania National Culture Center, it became a uh, quite effective and useful tool uh, for strengthening communities, uh, raising awareness, discussing very challenging issues regarding ice age on national and local levels. Of course, there are still uh, many weaknesses, uh, for instance, uh, applications by minorities or joint applications by several communities, as well as multinational nominations are not very numerous. Uh, folkloristic approach, stage representations are uh, quite frequent in applications, experts within the commission uh, responsible for the inscription um, uh, often demand uh, maybe too excessive evidences uh, of archaism or authenticity, even, even if it is not written uh, in the criteria of the national inventory. However, the comprehension of ICH uh, among uh, the ex experts coming from a uh, folklore field is gradually changing. Yeah? And uh, for example, uh, such um, challenging issues uh, about uh, minor related to minorities, the representation in various uh, traditions. For example, in 2018, 18, after heated debates, uh, one archaic uh, element, the Easter, Mystery play having very strong anti-Semitic aspects, despite of numerous defenders, uh, was not finally inscribed on the national inventory. Another case was quite opposite in 2022, uh, one spring carnival having some aspects of intolerant representation of minorities was inscribed after the dialogue uh, process with the practitioners, uh, which followed the recommendations of the Commission in the future to reflect and to discuss uh, on the purpose of such representations uh, within communities, etc. So we will see how it will uh, proceed, how it will develop. The next slide, slide please. So uh, how the national inventory, how it works. Uh, so uh, the Minister of Culture, of course, uh, sets uh, policy strategies and regulations. Lithuania National Culture Center, the main, uh, the main administrator of inventory, is responsible for developing this tool. I think the most important uh, function and the most uh, info important activity uh, which, which is led by, by the center is that they constantly organize these uh, workshops, seminars, capacity building activities, building partnerships with local administrators and communities. Um, uh, and really had very strong partnerships on, on local level. And of, uh, of course, we have the Commission of Intangible Culture Research Inventory, uh, uh, which uh, is consulting body and taking decisions. And also, uh, we succeeded uh, that uh, the Lithuanian Culture Foundation uh, after the inscriptions, I mean, if, uh, if the element is inscribed on the national element, it provides uh, support uh, from the Lithuanian Culture Foundation, not automatically, but uh, the projects related to the elements of national inventory uh, get get uh, kind of priority uh, in, in 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 the process of evaluation. The next slide, please. On the local level, uh, we have uh, 54 active uh, local inventory administrator and it is from 60 municipalities, so it's really covered by almost the whole territory of Lithuania. 
and uh, they really are in very good partnership with the Lithuania National Culture Center. Uh, the next slide, please. And which is also very important that uh, we, I, I think that if activities uh, of uh, promotion of inv inventory are very important. It, uh, that means it, in, in Lithuania we have this annual ceremony once per year in the city town hall. Uh, we have a ceremony of uh, awards of certificates for the inscribed elements and for the communities of barriers. Uh, it, it's very uh, important as an event for municipalities, for the chiefs of the municipalities, lo local and national authorities. So it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, a very good uh, uh, it's a traditional already what, what we are following and uh, often, not always, but often the ceremony is also broadcasted by our national, uh, Lithuanian national tele radio and television. The next slide, please. Uh, besides various other projects and programs uh, uh, implemented by, by various stakeholders, communities, uh, I think it's uh, a very good example of uh, of the result, the direct uh, result of the convention, because after the discussions with the cultural center in Klaipeda, it's the first, the third uh, big city of Lithuania. Uh, we decided just to organize since uh, 2017. I think it was the first time. Um, the, uh, the traditional uh, festival of uh, uh, focused only on intangible cultural heritage, uh, only on on the uh, inscribed elements on UNESCO list or on the national inventory. So um, uh, it's uh, really a big festival, a huge festival. It uh, differs from other folklore festivals uh, because the approach is really uh, of the related to ICH approach. Uh, so if you uh, get uh, invitations to this festival, go there without doubting. It's very well organized and a really true celebration of ICH. Uh, which comes uh, to present their tradition from all over the world. The next slide, please. Um, and um, we also very, very glad, very happy about this uh, cooperation with uh, our partners in other Baltic and Nordic states. Uh, this convention inspired uh, the building of this Nordic Baltic network of ICH. Uh, it made uh, developing the website, presenting good safeguarding practices from eight countries, including Greenland, Greenland, Island, and Piro Island. Uh, in this uh, website, we have already six practices from Lithuania, which are which are published in this website. Uh, it's a kind of good opportunity for us because, uh, for instance, we have no inscriptions on, on the list of, of good practices, uh, I mean the list, uh, the national list of UNESCO. And also, um, during these last years, uh, the, uh, a 10 states project living on sustainability in ICH uh, uh, involves uh, many practitioners and stakeholders from these uh, 10 states uh, to, uh, inviting to taking part in, or and taking, to take part in discussions and also it was an opportunity to implement local pilot projects on ICH and sustainability. I think it was a very good and inspiring um, uh, example of uh, cooperation, uh, sub-regional or regional. Uh, the next slide. And uh, to conclude, uh, I would say really very briefly that uh, despite of uh, different approaches, uh, 
uh, local national uh, folkloristic or maybe just uh, also approach which is uh, tending to heritage just just dies the 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 the, the traditions uh, to fix or to conserve them uh, but thanks to the flexibility of the convention and uh, its openness as as um, as a standard setting uh, instrument which is uh, really a very very uh, which presenting a very mod modern uh, way how to deal, how to work uh, with the tradition, how to uh, develop a preservation heritage systems. So I, I, I think that uh, that different approaches can somehow co co cooperate between them, and it it gives um, many it gives inspiration for not only for practitioners and and uh, and communities but also for administrators of cultural heritage uh, various stakeholders authorities etc it, it's really um, a concept who changes minds but in very uh, in, in a well, when very wise and and uh, and pluralistic and global global way. Uh, and and uh, really the final slide now. So uh, I also I would like to take this occasion also to to share with you about uh, one event who is coming uh, approaching. Uh, on the 9th uh, October, uh, we will, together with other NGOs and, and, and partners, we will open uh, the mural, uh, which is uh, called Lamna, Unbreakable, which will appear on one wall in, in the city of Vilnius, uh, in one of the uh, wall of buildings. Um, and it's of, of course it's dedicated to uh, to the freedom of uh, of Ukraine, to the importance of ICH also in in the fight for freedom, in the fight for uh, for strengthening cultural identity. About the, also it's it's dedicated to this cultural identity in general. Uh, and it also will also celebrate the 20th anniversary of the convention. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, and I will be grateful for all your questions if you have. To. Thank you very much, Milda. And now, uh, if you have some question to Spela or Milda. Dear colleague, friends, take a floor. If you want to ask anything, please feel free. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, presentations. And yes, here. Is it good? Okay. So I have a question to Mirda. Uh, about this Lithuanian Cultural Foundation. Could you um, tell us some more details about this uh, foundation? Um, about, uh, is it a support to the communities or to the institution? And uh, what kind of support is it? Is it an application? And uh, who, is the, who is the member or who are the members of uh, the decision uh, peoples? And uh, what is the aim? of this uh, support? I mean, uh, what kind of program is supported in this foundation? Sorry, thank you. It, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it is the main uh, cultural foundation. Uh, it's almost India. impossible to hear you. Uh, most of um, uh, cultural projects, uh, uh, applications of cultural projects are, are submitted to this uh, cultural foundation. It is the uh, it, it has been established by the Ministry of Culture, and uh, uh, this uh, foundation has uh, many uh, programs of support, uh, uh, visual arts, uh, media arts, uh, um, 
children um, children involvement etc cetera, etc cetera, many programs and one of these programs is dedicated to intangible cultural heritage and um, and uh, I, I think maybe uh, already uh, I don't know uh, five years or maybe year ago we just succeeded that just to put this priority uh, direction I I mean when when evaluating uh, projects uh, in the field of intangible cultural heritage that means that uh, if uh, it is inscribed in the national heritage that means that it's recognized as a very valuable tradition uh, and community and this community if they apply to the foundation they get support um, but uh, of course they should be uh, uh, they should have some some uh, institution in established to be able to to apply this foundation it's not uh, possible to to support financially uh, physical persons uh, um, so I, uh, I I hope I answered your, to your question Ok, Dora said thank you <laughs> Ďakujem, Dora. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for this first round. According to the program, we have a coffee break now. If you have the interpretation uh, devices, please leave it here. Uh, you can have a coffee or something sweet to eat. And our colleagues from Kovačica are inviting us for the vernisage uh, in the premises. Hopefully we will meet uh, here on time. There are still questions we cannot answer now, but hopefully all of you will stay by evening, therefore the questions will be answered throughout the rest of the program. And the puppet master are inviting us for the vernissage. 1540, we should meet here again. Thank you. So uh, we will start with the second part, but it's uh, very important contribution. I uh, welcome our dear friend PhD Barbara Morongova, and then I will hand over to uh, Mrs. Volanska, and she will continue to moderate the second part and uh, the bearers of these elements, and you can talk about your activities. Dr. Morongova. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I would be very happy to speak about the best practices and what the NGOs are doing, but he, now I'm here to represent the Ministry of Culture, so I have a more formal uh, contribution about the context uh, how the implementation is going on the, during this 20-year period. The title, Living Lived Life Heritage, uh, this is in the context of what Lubka said, uh, that uh, we are finally getting into practice this terminology, uh, which hasn't been so much anchored here, and the translations could be uh, very different. So that's why I used all the three terms, living, lived, and live. Uh, can contain uh, some varieties of uh, or alternations of, but uh, in, in the past we used to we were used to another different terminology. So I will be talking about the official instruments of state policy. The uh, central authority for the implementation of this convention is the Ministry of Culture, and the role of the ministry is enshrined in the or defined in the law. And uh, the part which is def uh, related to our topic is the cultural and educational part and also the folk uh, crafts production. Uh, we also uh, 
develop draft uh, bills, and uh, this is the main uh, role of our ministry, although uh, the law about uh, intangible cultural heritage does not exist, but what are the legislative instruments which we have at hand I will talk about in my contribution then. Uh, the elaboration of conceptual documents uh, for the protection and development of intangible cultural heritage and traditional folk culture. And last but not least, also the provision of subsidies to a broad range of applicants, uh, although we do have also other instruments. Um, part of the range of instruments for the implementation of the convention, we have uh, institutional, legislative, and financial instruments, uh, and I will focus on uh, each of those. A key one, uh, as far as the legislation is concerned, is the Constitution of the Slovak Republic, which defines the, the protection and safeguarding of the cultural heritage, but also including the intangible, although not uh, explicitly mentioned. Then we have this competence law, which is defining what is the competence of the Ministry of Culture, and uh, also which are the competences of the municipalities. Another important piece of legislation is with the one from 1958 about the folk uh, art uh, production, which is the oldest piece of law which is still effective, although uh, many things which it brought as benefits are no longer valid, so uh, some revision would be certainly welcomed. Uh, then we have another act on the protection of the monument fund. Uh, it may not be relevant, but uh, it speaks about the knowledge about the uh, folk architecture and things uh, which this law protects. Then we have the Act on Museums and Galleries and the pro uh, Protection of uh, Cultural Value Objects. So this is what uh, is represented by the artifacts. Uh, so if we talk about the collections. Another piece of legislation is also the Act on the State Language, because intangible uh, heritage uh, includes the oral expressions, and also the Act on the Use of the Languages of National Minorities, and then uh, copyright law. And in this context, I would like to mention that the objects on the phenomena of uh, traditional culture are not explicitly under this law because they like belong to everybody and there is no limitation. But in the practice, we see that also uh, with respect to communities, they contact us and they said they would need a protection because they see a misuse, but the copyright uh, or the authorship is being protected and what was produced by the people so as a folk production, this is not something which would be explicitly attributable to individuals. So the topics of intellectual property are things which are being discussed in many countries and globally. So the uh, instrument of protection to be found, uh, which would be part of the cultural heritage, this is going to be more and more in demand. Intangible cultural heritage, I would like to also point at uh, Act uh, from 2015 on the cultural and educational activities, because this one uh, is the one which implements the term uh, intangible cultural heritage, because it says that part of the cultural and educational activity is uh, this intangible cultural heritage. and. The ministry is the founder of two uh, institutions, and uh, there is a national uh, educational center and uh, also the folklorist, uh, which is the second institution, and also an amendment of this law brought provision of funding for different competitions in this spectrum of activities. That means that uh, this act also contains how these competitions are funded. Part of this law is also that the National uh, Center is uh, led by the center, which we know as uh, Slovakian uh, website, which is, should be also connected to uh, European, uh, which would in have uh, the results of digitalization work and other 
uh, stakeholders are involved in these efforts. The uh, law also uh, brings the possibility to establish different uh, specialized uh, centers of uh, folk culture, awareness ra raising centers. Uh, we have one in Miava, in Djetva, and then in Rožnjava. The institutional tools or instruments, I would talk about those which are belonging to the Ministry of Culture. The key one is the Slovak Folk uh, Art uh, Collective, and uh, this center first was established, and it was just uh, one person in 2008, and then from 2010, it was under uh, art collective and under uh, coordination, so now it's uh, under a different name, and it is also a key partner for us for this event. Another one, Uluv. This is competent for the craft and craftsmanship, and also the already mentioned national uh, outreach center. And uh, indirectly, there are also other professional and non-professional entities representing some uh, of this folk art, uh, either Lučnica, if you see back, and then other ones like Slovak National Museum, uh, which has uh, 18 specialized museums, including one focusing on the national minorities, then uh, puppet culture and uh, toys, uh, historical museum, musical museum uh, related to backpipe and other um, inscriptions. Plus, the Slovak National Library uh, is administering uh, different uh, collections, and also the Film Institute, which has a number of audio and visual heritage under its custody. Plus, uh, there is also for uh, vi visually impaired people a uh, Slovak uh, library. If we talk about that we are uh, disseminating this information, it's important to be able to disseminate it also to persons who have who are visually impaired, and that's why I mentioned also this library, specialized library. As far as financial instruments are concerned, uh, first of all, uh, it, the ministry provides financing to the organizations uh, founded by the ministry, and uh, plus uh, there is a budgetary source. Uh, then there is a subsidy system, but there have been some changes already introduced. Uh, for us, what is relevant is uh, the uh, architectural, for uh, folk art architecture part of this. And then there are some uh, money uh, allocated to people uh, who are also ha handicapped and uh, are working in this field. And there are then uh, some funds, um, fund for uh, supporting the art, uh, for identification, uh, archiving, and presentation of the intangible cultural heritage. Plus, there is a fund for the promotion of culture of national minorities and audiovisual fund. The finances are coming from the state budget and uh, made a contribution for to safeguard the cultural heritage. There was a big uh, digitization project. Part of it was a look ensemble and also digital museum where uh, some of their phenomena were digitized, like Roma culture was supported as part of this project. So now it's only being maintained. Some of them continue in their activities. Some have uh, declined their uh, documentation activity. Another package which was related to the promotion of creative potential in the region by promoting uh, crafts was the uh, mediator for the priority access three mobilization of creative potential and uh, 
there is also a, a free Wednesday access to museums uh, for the public so that also people who do not have uh, the money for this that they can uh, visit museums and other institutions. Strategic and conceptual material, we have the ratified UNESCO Convention, which, as it was mentioned, we ratified it in 2006. As a next step, the ministry established this participative uh, body, the Council for the Protection of Intangible Cultural Heritage. The concept of uh, taking care of the traditional uh, uh, cultural heritage. And in 2019, because of the extension of the operational directives which implemented the May Sustainable Development, we had to respond to this as a country. So uh, the concept of sustainable development of intangible uh, cultural heritage for the period 2020 to 25. Plus, we have uh, also an assessment report because we, as a member country, we have to submit it to UNESCO. The latest uh, document which is related to cultural uh, heritage is the strategy of culture and creative industry by 2030, which was adopted just recently. But there is still a clause missing, which is uh, not uh, or which has not been approved because at the moment we have just a temporary government and uh, we still have a task to create or develop a national action plan for the sustainable development of intangible cultural heritage for the period 24 and 25. Uh, we intended to do it uh, but it was said that we need to wait and first the uh, major document has to be approved and we then uh, we will put it into details in this action plan. The sustainable development, for those who are not familiar with this, uh, in the social development it is like safety of meals, uh, health care, quality of education, equality, gender equality and the access to clean and safe water. Uh, when this get, got to UNESCO, we were maybe uh, surprised uh, what, what is the relevance of this, but uh, it is closely related to intangible cultural heritage. And for every bullet point, we would find relevance anywhere in the world, how the knowledge about this really contributes to these goals. In the area of economic development, uh, and in the area of mutual uh, 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 all these are relevant topics, and Slovakia also had to uh, uh, participate uh, in this. And uh, we, uh, for the, we applied uh, uh, to secure the resilience of the refugees, uh, of, uh, and uh, therefore they are able to sustain the crisis when it comes to the. Uh, state authorities. The topic is really very wide and I would like to say that the partners are not only the Ministry of Culture but also from other ministries. The key stakeholders is the Ministry of Education um, which is uh, definitely important in the area of research and development but also in the area of artistic education, dual education, uh, elementary art school. So these uh, these are all topics for the Ministry of Education and we uh, know that the collaboration needs to be way more uh, intense and we are in communication with the Ministry of Education and we have a memorandum which will be signed and hopefully this government has the will and hopefully in the upcoming two weeks this memorandum will be signed but I would like also to say that the results of the concept 
uh, already broad, very successful collaboration. Uh, and uh, one of these successes was the topic of innovative uh, uh, regional culture. Mm, in this year, uh, we have already started with a new curriculum uh, reform and we would like to react to it and we are trying to find our ways how to be as the cultural uh, sector to be helpful when it comes to its implementation uh, in order to participate way participate way more uh, with, a, with an offer for the pupils themselves. Mm. Uh, besides the Ministry of Education, uh, there is also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is very important for us when it comes to cultural diplomacy and also collaboration with the uh, institutions, Ministry of Transportation in the context of uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage in uh, cooperation <coughs> of tourism, a Ministry of Agriculture. We also have many uh, common topics, for example, breeding of animals, hunting, fisheries, uh, but also so, uh, breeding of crops. These are uh, these are all the topics for the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, or for example, uh, breeding of falcons. Uh, these are all topics we are interested in. Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, and of uh, Environment. We have also many uh, topics. Ministry of Health. Even though the legislation uh, still doesn't open the topic of. Uh, folk medicine uh, we are discussing the topics of using uh, teas and etc because this we also consider to be intangible uh, heritage uh, it is not only the state authorities but also municipalities and the actions of uh, municipalities and the third sector NGOs uh, but we should not forget about the bearers of the intangible cultural heritage, which are the really key stakeholders in able to help the in help, in able to help the implementation. Uh, when it comes to the institutions, Mr. Hamar was supposed to be speaking more about this topic, so I don't know whether I'm supposed to continue. Maybe in the discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Marongova. She already showed us a very beautiful framework how to proceed forward. And it was very interesting when uh, uh, when we spoke about the reports for UNESCO, when it comes to safeguarding of the heritage on a national level, all the European countries are facing the same difficulties. Uh, for example, non-functional collaboration of ministries and at the same time uh, sh uh, low awareness about the tools which could help us to preserve and safeguard the heritage. But maybe this has to do with a low uh, knowledge and low awareness level. Uh, this is not only our uh, topic, but uh, many European countries are facing the same troubles. Uh, are we using the intangible cultural heritage and uh, a, a culture with a uh, capital letter at the same time? This also can be uh, a topic for a discussion. We have also overlapping topics, but Mm, let's move forward. Uh, Barbara already showed us who is important and I already said at the beginning that this convention deals uh, with an individual as well, uh, as a bearer of a tradition. Therefore, I would like to ask the representative uh, of, a, of an institution, but also a uh, uh, cult uh, cultural heritage creating individual, uh, the representative of Uluv, uh, and we will be speaking about the School of uh, Handcraft. The floor is yours. Mm. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm really happy uh, for receiving the opportunity to s address you today. And uh, I, will, I would like to show you uh, what I have been dealing for the past years, and these are the handcrafts, the ha traditional handcrafts. Uh, we will be speaking about the intangible uh, cultural heritage, but this is really a living thing for me that has lived in myself for many years. 
Mm, the Uluv School of Handcraft is a part of the institution. We are under the, uh, in the competence of the Ministry of Culture because as an institution itself, we are uh, trying to preserve the handcraft. We are systematically trying to safeguard the bearers of these handcrafts and all those who are very important for us. And we are trying to develop the traditional handcraft. Uh, and our objective is the sustainability for future. So we're trying to connect it to with the design. So it's overlapping to design matters. And we're trying to preser preserve what is beautiful for us. So there is a, a whole complex of care for the tradition. The School of Handcrafts has uh, formed in the 20th century, in the 80s of the 20th century. Uh, and we started, uh, we, we were starting to uh, safeguard the producers and all those who secure the protection of the handcraft, uh, but we have developed, uh, uh, thanks to the political situation in the 90s, that Uluv opened uh, and became a more cultural institution and therefore in 1999 as the School of Handcrafts we have formed the first courses for the general public, uh, laymen and also for the experts, we started to teach the handcraft. Uh, also, the education became one of the parts, one of the bearers of the traditional handcrafts. What is important for us, for the school, is that we preserve and we are trying to develop the traditional uh, handcrafts as a part of the cultural heritage. And this protection uh, is uh, taking place in three regional schools of handcrafts. The first one emerged in 1999 in Bratislava. Uh, uh, at present, we have uh, a very wide range of educational activities in terms of traditional culture. Uh, second center has been uh, <coughs> established in Banska Bystrica, and it's focused on the, uh, of the of those techniques that are threatened, that could extinct. And the third, the latest, has emerged in 2013 in Košice, and we have also workshops and we are profiling the center as an overlapping center of design and handcrafts. We are com uh, uh, collaborating with universities, uh, dealing with design matters. What is very uh, important and an integral part of our action is to support all expert departments because without mapping of what we have done from 1945 that uh, we have been collab uh, collecting uh, items so we created a database of all the photographs manuals and all this we can use uh, in in our centers in order to increase the quality of education and we want to be teaching the handcrafts uh, in a complex way and we want to preserve our tradition. In 2015, we managed to get into the Slovak uh, list and also we are trying to get into the best practices uh, of UNESCO. Uh, when it comes to education, why it is so essential for us? It's a systemic long-term education in the area of traditional handcraft. The target groups from the foundation of schools are uh, adults, children, seniors, uh, retired people, but we are still in the area of informal leisure activity even though our name is the School of Handcrafts. Uh, all our participants lo love our schools because we are traditional and at the same time non-traditional and we have many enthusiasts who attend our venues. What is important for the quality of our education is to have quality uh, tutors. So we need to have those people who are handcraft professionals and at the same time are teaching. 
and uh, for the past 25 years we have a very functional scheme. The participant of the course becomes a tutor and at the same time uh, they are they are becoming uh, <coughs> uh, producers. Uh, what is really necessary to say is an internal control of the processes when it comes to the criteria of quality is a unified uh, methodology what is taught in Bratislava has to be the same in Košice and in Baska Bystrica uh, at the same time uh, we have equipment if somebody wants to attend our courses doesn't need anything we give them everything uh, we for us, it is important that we use a personal attitude, personal approach, and uh, uh, the content of the course needs to be in line with the timely uh, manner uh, of, of this uh, education. Uh, we have field trips uh, for the pupils in kindergartens or any uh, any person who is interested we will show them how these handcrafts work we have creative workshops where our tutors our teachers show the techniques and what is really essential to say in an hour and a half kids uh, have a possibility to get in touch with the materials with the tools and also what is important to say that these kids are leaving with a produced product so they can be proud of themselves that they produce something by their own hands and this is really of key importance for us here you can see a few samples what our kids are producing the courses for children are organized for uh, five to six children mm. we would like to emphasize that the uh, we want to teach kids how to be creative, how to draw, how to paint. We show them the technique and they uh, use their creativity. Uh, during the summertime, we don't hesitate. We have uh, daycare uh, camps where kids can get in touch with the handcrafts. Children are from eight to nine years. Uh, and then 10 to 15 uh, years of age. What is important for us, uh, at the end we um, organized uh, an exhibition where the children can show to the others that really I managed to produce this by myself and the atmosphere is really great. When it comes to the courses for adults, uh, the target groups are composed of beginners but also from advanced professionals uh, who want to get better in what they do. We have uh, uh, many uh, kinds of courses, short term, long term, intense, less intense, but what is important is the contents. Uh, we really keep the quality at a very high level um, and we are using many items which are registered in the lists of uh, of uh, handcrafts, for example, lacing, fuyara pipes, uh, almost extinct techniques. Uh, really, we have many, many techniques. Uh, majority of the long-term courses are being accredited by the Ministry of Education, so the graduates of these uh, courses receive a certificate. I will move forward. Besides the education for adults, we are also working with other target groups, for example, the teachers or uh, lecturers, and we are organizing uh, repeated courses, and we have the representation of three regional workplaces. We can manage the whole territory of Slovakia, and these courses are tailor-made. There are, from one point of view, uh, theory-based, and uh, the many many of the people are uh, mainly interested in the practice because they want to use the techniques they learn also when teaching their pupils activities at festivals are also a part 
of using our techniques in, uh, in practice and the impact is really for us very important in order to spread the awareness and we really have many many skilled participants and uh, our graduates are subsequently forming clubs of handcrafts we have six clubs in individual particular uh, regional centers they're also collaborating with uh, uh, designers visual artists and we are also collaborating with them at the level of producers and hopefully the handcrafts will be living thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much and please keep your questions because after three uh, presentations we will have a Q&A session. Uh, just the bridging element. Uh, what is interesting about Ulu, uh, they're trying to find the balance between uh, how to preserve the techniques and folk and techniques, and this is the part of the heritage. And at the same time, in connection with design, it is looking for the living part. And in, uh, in uh, our UNESCO, we use our term uh, musification, so uh, somehow to digitize it and capture it in some form, and then to work with it so it stays as a living uh, object. And then I would be interested, Spell and Dora would know, maybe uh, we will ask uh, during the discussion part whether they have any such uh, institution uh, to get some more inspiration for us now i would like to ask mr babka we'll move to serbia and then uh, hopefully we'll have more time to look at the exhibition Thank you for your patience to continue listening. Well, we are a minority, and if you are born somewhere in the world and your language, your mother tongue is as a minority language, uh, that person has a need, greater need, for them to be understood by the majority. So the Slovak minority living in Serbia has found one way how to do that. And that is by expression through this insight or naive art. But this was something which was created here in Slovakia, in Bratislava, when this Triennale was organized by the National Gallery. Uh, the other places of the world call it a naive uh, art. So the first one, uh, exhibition was in 1928 in Paris. And the French, when they didn't know what to do, they got uh, Henry Russo, and they, this was good for them. And also the, his pictures was like that. So Picasso made the <laughs> income, and then it was how, somehow lost and uh, spread to Yugoslavia, where it arrived somewhere in the 30s. And even the oldest piece of art which we have at hold and which we consider to be part of this heritage is from 1936. The first exhibition in Kovacica was in 1952 when we celebrated 150th anniversary of establishing this uh, village. They said that this group knows how to dance, uh, then uh, music, and then we have the painters. So they uh, made an exhibition. So since then, for 70 years, we have been organizing this exhibition of the naive art. In Kovacica, it is more about women uh, than men, because we are Lutherans, Protestants. 
and the man just a white shirt and uh, black uh, black suit and nothing in colors and the women had to make their uh, clothing themselves and when our predecessor was here in the 50s so they were living in this uh, um, countryside and they saw only green and brown and they got here which is all plain land so where they see also yellow uh, the uh, women still have to uh, have to make their clothing and uh, they were including more colors into their dresses and that Zuzana Halupova was our um, most known uh, artist. Uh, she wanted to paint and said to the man, well, I can do it also, it's not just for you. And the man said to her in the 50s back there, Shut up, Zuza. The women are supposed to just sew and make dress dresses and clothing and uh, well don't worry the, there was a good ending to this they had to uh, of course women had to make their dresses and decorate it and they of course had a better feeling for doing this and when the men got afraid what if the women get organized themselves uh, they said Zuza come here you would become the painter and uh, you will have the exhibitions so if this would happen to Day, this, they would tell her, well, just uh, do it, uh, do try to make uh, paintings, uh, but if they turn around, then uh, there will be a no, no, no. But if you are just a minority living in a country, uh, uh, we know in a village, we live in a village and where we know every single person, so if you know that there is a drunkard there, there were people who, of course, the, all the people knew this fact about him. So even today, uh, there are more women at painters, and uh, the man had to think about our other things uh, because in the village, living in the village, there are things to do and come up with new things. If you look at her first painting, the, there is a person kneeling and praying, and there is a maze in front of her. We, as men, want to marry younger women, but as a statistics, uh, the women live longer. So after the man dies, so what is uh, the woman supposed to do? Still wait and just weep until uh, she also is taken to heaven? So most of us men thinks about things think this way. So Jonas, when he was still uh, healthy and running around, also uh, under Brigitte Bardo, we have a documentation. What does it mean to uh, to be very famous? So while he was still uh, running around with his picture, and then now when he was weak and old, uh, he knows that what his experience was. At the time when he was painting these pieces of art, when we get to this age, you know uh, how we change in our thinking. Uh, the young uh, men, of course, uh, they are painting more young people uh, who are in love, and the practical painters, of course, also share who uh, or how they characterize uh, fellow painters. So they say there is no more insight or no more naive uh, art. And this identification has never been identical all over the world. I don't know how to say this, but mostly those socialist countries uh, 
captured this uh, naive art. Our, uh, it was said that uh, our people were able to uh, work for eight hours, then eight hours uh, sleep, and then also eight hours do our, some art. Uh, our people were painting, and then it was said that, okay, this is this naive or inside uh, art. In 2018, uh, we, uh, sorry, we were uh, late by, uh, for uh, adhering to this convention and uh, it was inscribed in 2016. And now uh, we came up with this idea of intangible. So think about uh, Susanna Halpo and those first one. What would they think about this intangible art or heritage? We don't tell the painters what to paint or what not to paint. Some of these uh, pieces of art are somehow too much uh, or, or they are overdone. Uh, we wanted Kovacica to be a tourist center. We have uh, seven and a half American tourists who come by boat and they come to have a visit to Kovacica. And they want everything to be high. And the tourists start to influence what is going to be painted. One would say, uh, we would like to have more green here. Uh, in five minutes later, somebody would suggest, uh, oh, red would be nicer. Uh, but we have quite a number of uh, uh, painters. And then some, after some years, uh, he loses or she loses her or her style. He has to be stubborn. And we do have some uh, of this kind from this generation. Some of them say that those historical ones, uh, they are not looking at those historical painters, uh, but they are just looking what is the latest source. So that's why we uh, approached it in this way that we established this center for digitalization of insight or naive art. Um, then uh, when you look what was painted in the 50s, 60s of the last century, and then we can have a look whether this new generation can have a say into this and anything new into this. As I said, we are a minority living there. Uh, we are not running after everything what is new, but we are trying to keep to the things which are old or traditional. Uh, we can see it also here on the painters. If uh, you get uh, a husband to a next uh, village and he, well, these uh, you know, ladies are still uh, using the traditional language or archaic language. We welcome always uh, such persons. Also, that you invited me here, it is good. And I can uh, speak Slovak, uh, but not perfect, of course. And I can read the Slovak web sites. And uh, Juraj Hamar is here, and on Monday he was back in Kovacica with us. And uh, the ministry said that we actually got uh, uh, the first part of this project, and we have to get involved and we must be much better to be second uh, so that we can follow the um, subject. So thank you again for inviting me to this seminar and for you to listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Pavel Babka from the Babka Foundation from Kovacica. 
And we would really appreciate if our minorities were more active. We would receive more proposals for an application of a minority. So you are really a role model for us. And really, your speech was a role modeling speech uh, when it comes to what we've already spoke about uh, for the community of the bearers, that the identity is created through the paintings, for example, and it's supposed to be for everyone, even for the eldest generations, and even the eldest generations can participate. Mm, for example, it can be one bearer, one man or one woman. You already mentioned the tourism and its problems. And this is why I think that UNESCO as a platform or, or, or the convention as a platform of interchange of information, it's great that you can see that you are not alone and all the communities which are collaborating in the area of art uh, and culture um, all these communities are having the same issues. So let's try to find inspiration and let's exchange our knowledge. But I'm talking too much and I'm ending with the topic of uh, UNESCO as an inspiration. I would like to ask, uh, maybe now it's the time for discussion. Are you having any questions towards each other? Please talk, because I'm a little bit tired already. How is it with education or generally with the living uh, heritage in Slovenia? Is it a part of the formal or informal education? I have to say, to say that we have a very good uh, system of, let's say, informal education in schools. We call them either. Can yeah. you please move? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So it's about uh, clubs. You now it's a part of the school education, but it's not the formal curricula. So it's after, after the morning sessions, let's say, that children join clubs. So one of the biggest clubs, they are uh, beekeeping clubs. There are around 200 around. This is really huge. Uh, there are, let's say, lace making clubs and so on. So there are some subjects that are called uh, sort of voluntary compulsory subjects that the pupils need to choose out of a list. So among them, there are a couple of topics that you would, you know, could designate as intangible cultural heritage sub subjects. Uh, so this is one. Uh, what we like to name as a, as a good practice example is, uh, is arts education, which is very much developed. And it, has, it, it is as, a, a, as an activity that is sort of horizontal. So this is something that, that has been going on for, for, for years, for a very long time. And every, I don't remember now which month, I think it's April or May, sorry, we have a big festival of arts education where all the cultural in institutions come and it's a fair in our biggest uh, cultural and congress center. And, they, and it's intended for, for school children and for, and for their teachers. So it's a festival, so there is a whole variety of activities that mu museums offer, that contemporary dance theatres offer, and so on. And it's also a program of lectures and so on. So it's both educational and it's just for them to see what's out there. And we have managed to actually uh, develop the, the European Heritage Days, which are often connected to ICH, especially this year, because it's the year of uh, skills and I don't know how is it called uh, um, uh, officially. So we have what is now formalized in schools. It's a week of cultural heritage. And each year it has a different topic. So our Institute for the Protection of Cultural Heritage this year, uh, this year chose the topic of let's say, dying traditional professions. So there's a lot of craftsmanship and so on. So this is one week 
that is usually going on for the whole month because schools can't really single out one week only to talk about cultural heritage. So this is then connected to the European Heritage Days, but it's a special program that they uh, dedicate time to. So, so it's, it's a not variety. a variety. It's yeah, not one single institution, exactly. as in our case, but, but you have a oh. variety. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And maybe Dora, just two sentences. How is the situation in Hungary? So we can inspire each self. Thank you. So just two. <laughs> okay. So actually, uh, in Hungary, um, the situation is like the same uh, in Slovenia and maybe in uh, Slovakia, and uh, we have um, um, another uh, topic about uh, bobbin lens making, what is in uh, Slovenia as well. And uh, for example, uh, we have this tradition in one uh, village uh, near the Balaton. And uh, in this uh, town, uh, this is the part of curriculum, sorry, uh, uh, this tradition. And every children learn this uh, lace making uh, during uh, the ele elementary school. Uh, so this is uh, one part, and uh, we have some um, workshops, maybe not, this is not workshop courses, uh, after the school, um, it's a kind of uh, afternoon program uh, for the children, uh, for example, about the pottery or about the dances and music schools. And um, we have a basic art school, maybe this is the correct English uh, word, uh, which is, uh, which is um, an afternoon pro program for the children. So it's a voca Something. vocational, like schools afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So, in addition to, to what what uh, the folk, Center for Folk Art Production is is doing. Okay. Thank you very much. You already <coughs> thought over the questions. I will not force you to talk. There is no way. Okay. <coughs> I would like to ask Andrea uh, Jagnerova uh, from the Center of Traditional Art. She's the representative of the center and she will be speaking about what they do and how they uh, safeguard this topic. Just to uh, give you more details, I'm the, from the Center of Traditional Arts in Djetva and we are basically a branch of the uh, other cultural center. Uh, we have been uh, founded in 2011 and we are uh, we have been operating for uh, three years. We have been curbed a little bit by the pandemic, but we already have certain successes. I'm very happy to present them. The Center of Traditional Art was supposed to be a detached center of uh, the Podpolianske uh, Awareness Center, but uh, I was presenting a concept how to uh, specialize this newly founded organization to research. Now we have a team of three. Uh, we have a short videos prepared for you and our colleague who is a technician is representing us at, uh, uh, at a, f a fair in Banska Bistrica. Uh, we are seated in a very modest uh, <clears throat> building. We only have a small office uh, together with the warehouse and the uh, employees are also uh, expecting certain things from us. We are organizing folk events in Djetva and uh, at the same time, we have certain commitments towards uh, the institution that has founded us and we are forced to earn uh, in order to be capable of operating. And our main objective is to document <clears throat> the items of traditional culture and we were trying to find the ways how to merge all these activities and we think that the awareness uh, is the most important and we want to connect it with the results of our research. As an example, I would like to show you a few examples. We uh, made a research uh, about combing of hair, how uh, women and children uh, were making their uh, 
their hair designs of their braids and uh, we uh, created courses and we invited not only children but also their grandmothers and grand grandmothers and majority of children are participating in cultural events uh, in one very specific uh, braid uh, design Mm, we have many varieties of these hairstyles. We are teaching the children how to create them. And in a very similar way, we taught the participants how to create laces, necklaces, uh, very, old, uh, very old pendants, how to teach them how to produce uh, uh, many other uh, old, almost extinct items, and uh, also we had to take, uh, we, ha we also had to make a research, uh, field trip researches, and we have very positive uh, relationship uh, to many uh, techniques. Uh, we are dealing uh, with the children when it comes to the timely uh, time range, one third of our activities are dealing with children. Mm, for example, we have a festival of Roma culture, Jetva uh, folk uh, events. Mm, these children fun games, uh, and the parents in Jetva and in the adjacent regions know that uh, they can uh, have their kids in our premises where their children will be really having a very quality time making handcrafts in hour and a half the children are teach are learning a technique and they are returning to home with already produced items we are also presenting our uh, results uh, to many other target groups. Uh, throughout the, the past year, we um, uh, visited uh, people from the Lesh and Turiepole villages, where uh, it is now an army area, military area, and it was a very interesting field trip research. We focused on the songs and also on memorabilia and uh, So this is very short show of the songs. The ladies are dressed in the traditional clothes, even though they were not using it for a long time. And we really appreciate that the participants are then participating in our events. They were singing with us. They were checking whether we do it properly. And it was really interesting and impacted the younger participants. So we were creating these shoes. They were basically baked in an oven. It was really difficult to put it on afterwards. Together with Mr. Yurcho, we carried out research to find out uh, how the handcraft of these shoes, uh, how it was handcrafted. Uh, when it comes to the knitting and designing of these uh, wool shoes, we also created a specialized uh, publication, a book. You can find the procedures how to how to uh, handcraft how to uh, manufacture these shoes and these uh, uh, woolen wool uh, shoes will become a part of the intangible cultural heritage because no one has been dealing with this uh, technique for a long time and hopefully this book will serve as an inspiration how to create a fashionable item Another area we have been dealing with uh, in the past two years are, uh, is, are the bakery products, cakes and the bread. Uh, also, it was an uh, integral part of uh, weddings. 
in certain regions they were also preparing it for different other uh, for different other venues but we already have locations where it's a matter of past this is why we created another book uh, cakes for weddings and in selected of the villages from Banska Bistrica region we carried out field trip uh, field trip research focused on the decorating of the cakes and also accompanying events, um, handing over of the cakes, cutting the cake. It was really very pleasant work. It was really great research because in each location we were uh, welcomed uh, really very pleasantly. In the Podpolanya region there is uh, very uh, <clears throat> huge tradition of knitting and lacing, uh, but we are monitoring that these knittings are uh, losing their traditional local character. The the designs are uh, mutually interchanged, or they see it on the internet, or they see it somewhere else. And here you can see uh, what is the change. Uh, on one side you can see the old item, on the right side you can see a newer one, or how the, how the uh, uh, templates, how the designs are developing. And we are looking for, looking for archaic uh, designs. We started with uh, uh, female aprons, uh, from the beginning of 20th century. Uh, we started the museums and also during our field trips and all the designs uh, is uh, redrawn manually. Really, this is very demanding work as there is over 200 designs. Uh, these designs need to be cleaned uh, in the computer program, but we managed to make a catalog of designs on female aprons. Here you can see the so-called formai, which are the designs which vary on the skirts and on the aprons of women. This is the first edition of the catalog. Mm. So these are the apron designs. These were uh, handmade, uh, knitted. Mm. This is one-to-one -one scale. And nowadays, you can see on the picture, we are dealing with a second part. We focused on scarves, uh, which are integral part of female uh, designs, female clothes. And uh, this is why we want to make awareness that the scarves uh, and the, cl uh, uh, the cloths need to get back to the female uh, heads. And uh, we are very happy that certain products can already be purchased. Uh, it will be published in our catalog. Our newest project, which I would like to uh, brag with a little bit, is uh, called Heligonkari. And uh, the output will be uh, a footage. And just like a knitting, also playing on uh, the instrument is a living, uh, intangible uh, heritage. It was used uh, on weddings, on different parties, uh, elsewhere where possible. And the project Heligonkari has been prepared with an expert collaboration, Mr. Obuch and Professor Kral. Also in the scenic folklore, here you can see a part of the footage. What we can see in the video documentation is the oldest generation of the players. From there saying, we uh, are trying to find out how they were growing up. And the document should be a methodological document for younger instrument players, but hopefully it will, it will also speak to the other older ones. We are still looking for opportunities and options how to deal with certain topics, how to 
share it with the general and expert public. For example, we carried out a research focused on the decoration of graves during the All Saints holiday. Uh, we uh, received a really interesting information and we uh, were thinking about how to mediate this information. Together with the local people, we made a reconstruction of the decoration of graves because it was various for the children, for a single person or for uh, married uh, adults. Then we created an, an instruction uh, video and it was really interesting to find out that many of the uh, inhabitants of the Djetva municipality uh, were uh, copying and there were also uh, uh, lighting uh, candles on the graves. This is a short show. We were using different kinds of paper to create these artificial roses. Uh, then we, uh, we were using candles which were lit. And the last things I would like to say is uh, we were using YouTube for publishing our videos, but this platform is not enough for us. Therefore, we contacted Mr. Kissel at the Center for Traditional Culture and uh, he told us uh, that we are supposed to create an online database to publish the results. Uh, also, uh, thanks to the methodological guideline uh, from the Bratislava Center, we managed to publish the da this database in March. Uh, it's already published. and. Uh, we have 300 cultural objects and we will really appreciate if this amount will increase. This database is of a different, of a, of a very similar character compared to the Center for Traditional Culture database. Here you can see a short example. Uh, a symbol of our work uh, is an oak leaf because it used to uh, stand for stubbornness, longevity, force and strength, which are really great characters, which, uh, uh, which are great values we will need in our work, work afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I also got in mind some other things I uh, will try to summarize. So it's not just a research on a single object, but it's a regional or regionally based uh, research, what is there in a specific region. So the time is the element which is miss we are all missing. And uh, another important issue, which uh, already was mentioned by Mrs. Morongova, is the ownership issue. Whose is this uh, heritage? Because it's a public, or it should be belonging to everyone. Because what happens if an uh, artist would take this uh, list of samples and he would start producing something and maybe selling it and the community has no benefit of it. So this is what we need to consider. That's of course we want to make it accessible to all, but it's also about uh, raising awareness to those, uh, provided to those who are using it because we all uh, should share this. We still have two, also my favorite villages, and it's like a model or role model for us. So I would uh, invite uh, Mr. Brlosh from Hrusho. Well, I don't know how you are going to concentrate it into 20, 12 minutes, but uh, we will try. Thank you. I <laughs> wish you a nice day. Yeah, we traveled the world. Europe, institutions, national, regional institutions, and we should go back to our own nest from which the traditional culture comes from. 
So back to our own village to keep our identity based on the traditional culture because it's uh, very diverse. So I invite you to Hrushov, where uh, we are also trying to keep these traditional elements as uh, were left to us by our predecessors. Uh, Hrushov is in, a, I call it a triangle. In the uh, Hunt region, which even exceeds to Hungary, what are the forms and methods? Uh, well, first, it's a human being. These are personalities. There is a mixture here, and you can see different professions, a teacher, a mayor, a driver, a farmer, etc., etc. Let me paraphrase uh, some uh, yes, businessmen ask to be a painter to make uh, All Saints picture, and he wanted his face to be there as well. Yeah, we want, uh, we need, of course, the people so that we can manage all these things. So how we can uh, keep and safeguard uh, the traditions? Um, so we do not uh, do the ceremonies. Uh, through the carnival season, but it is uh, done when the real season is, not just for commercial reasons. Uh, in our case, uh, we are doing this uh, during the fasting, so that's why we have dark clothing and uh, the girls are coming in their original closing, sorry, in the civilian closing, and here the sound expression is the important. Then we have different organizations, and uh, we have a folk ensemble, a fire brigade, the union of pensioners, the club of handicapped, and uh, there are civil associations organizing different events for the public, plus uh, video documentation and photo documenting, audio documenting. I'm not going to mention this festival because most of uh, people know this. Then we have this collection activity. Uh, we do creative workshops, uh, different educational events uh, on different topics of different art crafts. We have uh, different exhibitions. Uh, I'm uh, running through this. I apologize, but uh, so that uh, we don't stay just uh, with me. So. For all these activities, uh, Anka Belushova was participating, so I invite her to continue. <laughs> so I am the wife of Mr. Berlosh, and I would like to talk about the children's folk group, folk ensemble. I have been uh, leading this ensemble since 1992. We tried to be on the podium with a choreography uh, showing some customs. I tried to teach them some songs, uh, traditions. Uh, dialect and just to be able to continue in these activities we need to prepare our children and youth and to answer the question which we get uh, very often when uh, we get the visitors and they are asking how do you manage to get the young people for these activities it is uh, through this folk group or folk ensemble they must well I'm not saying they must help 
but I invite them to come and help. And uh, if you don't find your place, then I will put you into a, some place. So if we, when we have these folk festivals, they are helping for different uh, sites uh, or places where different crafts and different traditions are shown. And these are the members of this folk ensemble. During this 30-year period, it's uh, more than 300 members, and uh, there are enough to represent us, not just to show what we are able to do, but also to bring up those uh, who are going to be our followers. This is about this uh, children's uh, folk ensemble. And there is one additional thing which we want to teach them. It's uh, an event, a uh, bus of goodwill. Before Christmas, we go to visit uh, orphanages and senior homes. And uh, we have been doing this for 26 years. It's not just going there, bring some gifts or some pastries, or we just show them some, or make some performance of some uh, music and dance. And uh, we also visit those who cannot uh, come uh, to see us and they go to uh, patients who are uh, on the bed and they are weak. And we try to uh, make these young people to feel the responsibility to help these elderly people who are at the end of their lifetime. So this is what we are trying to do in Hrushov. There is one more activity and this is our publication activity. When we wanted to do some stage forms, we did some research and we, of course, we knew uh, what were the customs before and uh, we wanted to or we needed some literature uh, to take uh, and use as a basis. And when we were reading this book, we saw that, of course, the research was extensive, but because, the extensi uh, because it covered the whole region, it didn't cover every single village. And there were some pieces of information and knowledge which we were able to contribute, so we were thinking about how we could enlarge and extend this research so that we can hand it over to the young generation and if somebody wants to continue in this, that they would have a valuable basis. So we were asking the experts and ethnology experts, so finally we made up a group of four and then invited uh, Professor Botik to help us with this. And in 2010, we asked for or applied for a grant, and we wanted to first publish a monograph. But uh, of course, it was not the only objective to uh, publish a book. Just uh, we wanted to collect everything possible from the traditional culture, so it's a lot. And finally, we decided, and uh, this, this idea came from our former mayor, that we are not going to publish a book, but every year we would concentrate uh, on one topic. So every year it would cover one topic. So the first one, uh, it was Book of Songs, because we don't, didn't know how to start. And we had a collection of more than 500 songs. So it was a song book and uh, wedding customs for Hrusho. Uh, These were the two first two songs. We had also the children's songs, wedding customs, and uh, different uh, themes. Uh, there were also uh, uh, ceremonial things. And then we looked at the folk costumes and the different forms of the folk costumes. Uh, we had to buy back from the Slovak Academy of Science the old uh, pictures, photos, uh, which uh, were not no longer held by uh, our village. 
Uh, the folk costume is now a bit different from this, but the, this book contains the oldest uh, forms. Also, how to take care or how did they take care of the folk costumes? Plus, uh, uh, also the patterns were attached, so uh, you can even make your own. Then the uh, uh, next part was concentrated again on customs, uh, also related so songs. Then uh, architecture, so this was more for the men, and also the authors were two men and one lady. They described the local architecture, also the buildings different, of different use. This uh, book was written by Professor Botik. It was about Hrušo and the uh, residents of Hrušo. Uh, we had to have a professional, like a guarantor or sponsor, uh, so that the book is uh, a meeting all the required uh, Things and then we looked at the farming, farming. How did or what did they do? <laughs> I'm not going to go into details because my time is up. And then, uh, of course, uh, on the other hand, uh, was a ladies' book where we described the life of uh, women uh, in. Uh, Hrušov, how, uh, what they did around the house, uh, if uh, they needed some medical help or what were the curative things. So all the recipes which we were able to collect uh, to the most uh, contemporary ones. Uh, the next one, the next book was about uh, what has been uh, or a narrative what was kept in the memories of uh, Russo residents and even back to the history of Turks, the description of the World War I and World War II. We thought that World War I was very, very or many, many years ago, but we were very surprised that there were so many vivid memories about how they uh, uh, remembered because there were 60 men from Husho who didn't return from the war. Then uh, Badin uh, uh, residents were evacuated because the front was still there, and then uh, uh, we organized a meeting of families from both villages. Next one was about the commu different communities in Hrušo, the first schools, uh, where did they go uh, for looking for jobs and then a clerical part. I was looking at the whole year uh, because I felt that there is an absence that we as Catholics, we do not know what are the festivals or ceremonies. So this clerical part was the, uh, analyzed uh, in a view of uh, Hrušo. Uh, resident uh, on a day of Barbara, who was Barbara, the Saint Barbara. So, of course, uh, I had a consultation with two priests so that it, of course, everything was verified. The next one was for the ceremonial songs different, uh, it's difficult to even express for myself. There were some specifics. And then I uh, lost the book, and that's uh, what I conclude with. The Hrušo 
families. We have been getting ready for this for the last eight to ten years. We have the family trees for whole uh, Russo. And uh, during pandemic, uh, we had enough time. There are 600 pages of this book, and we still do not cover the whole Russo. We were able to register all the kids born in Hrusho from 1907 to 1950. We have all the children born there. Uh, my husband was looking at one computer, looking at the register of birth. So everything which was chronologically registered. So this was uh, taking us four months. And then I was drawing the schemes or these family trees and another uh, colleague was uh, taking it or putting it into the computerized form. So I wanted to uh, also make public some things about these families, so uh, it was difficult to decide what could be published or what could not be published or disclosed, but we do have some of these books with us, and if you are interested, tomorrow you can have a look. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for both presentations. Uh, we really are not in time because it was difficult to manage uh, in 12 minutes. Uh, I don't know how you're managing uh, how all the books are on one shelf. Uh, and, I ho and I think you're still not finished. So really, this is, uh, we have a huge respect uh, and we really appreciate the enthusiasm uh, which can do a lot. And we really appreciate having you here as an example what can be managed in one uh, village and how the collaboration with the experts uh, can, be, can be also managed. So this seems to be an ideal model. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, the representative of the Oravska Polhora village who will be speaking about how they deal with uh, traditions. Thank you very much for the invitation. On behalf of Oravska Polhora uh, municipality, I would like to present the uh, safeguarding of the culture of Gorals uh, and uh, Gaidosh culture. Uh, the first item has already been registered into the list of uh, representative cultures in 2016 and the Goral culture was uh, registered in uh, 2021. So this is our last success. Uh, I would like to speak about the ways how they preserve the traditions and how many other institutions are dealing with it. I would like to show you the education part. So preserving through the kindergartens and schools uh, we have school club called Polhorček, managed by the municipality. Then we have the kindergarten and elementary school. I will go fast through this because I want to speak about the projects. We, of course, have uh, regional education <coughs> together with the clubs. Uh, we also have the mm, exchange of a cultural item in the framework of a family. Uh, for example, there's Gvara, which is the Goral dialect as, a, as an accent. Uh, mm, and this is being taught in the family, but also in a certain institution. But you will never uh, learn it if you don't learn it at, uh, at, at home. Uh, this also has to do with the uh, human, uh, with uh, with the handcrafts. But I would like to speak about the projects in our village, which uh, deal with the preservation of culture. <coughs> we are receiving the uh, finance from the Interreg projects, from the Polish as well as Czech ones. Uh, I will speak briefly about the projects, uh, which are focused on the safeguarding of the culture, not only represent it, but also to protect it. 
and we want to keep also the traditions for the younger generation and the majority of the projects are focused on this preservation uh, for example we had a daycare uh, camp for children <clears throat> where we were teaching uh, kids how to dance we were publishing many traditional uh, fairy tale publications uh, I selected only those most uh, important projects. So the first very important uh, project dealing with the Gaidos culture uh, is carried out through the Interreg Poland Slovakia. And uh, this has been financed from the European Union. And this project is influential because, because we uh, collected uh, hum, uh, musical instruments. Uh, the pipes cost uh, around 1,000 euros, and if you were asking for 1,000 euros uh, in a family, they wouldn't be able to spend it. Even though the culture is widespread, they wouldn't be uh, able to say whether they are willing to finance it because they, the, the outputs are uncertain. In this project, uh, our village, Olarovska Polhora, participated uh, as a facilitator, but together with the Rapcha and Sihelne villages, which are also one of the main centers of the culture. And within this project, we also published one lecture book uh, with the book itself and a CD. Uh, we already had very similar project a couple of years ago, but we updated the results. Therefore, we published a DVD with videos showing how to play the instrument. Additional interesting thing is that we created a system for the kids without the notes when you're playing the pipe uh, music instrument. Mm. You can we, we, we show them which uh, hole should be covered or open. So this is a really very good manual for the children to teach them how to play the instrument. These are the creative workshops where the children had workshops themselves and uh, concerts. This project is a newer one and it's very uh, important for the village because in this project we created European culture of uh, of music of this uh, pipe music instrument teaching uh, and each of these rooms are used for different purposes mm, uh, in the on, on the left hand side you can see the certificates of registration with statues and also a mini museum where we collected artifacts and old items from the producers of the musical instruments uh, so uh, instruments for production and items which help us to produce these instruments therefore people who visit this center can see what needs to be uh, done in order to produce the instrument and we, you can also see a comparison of other European varieties of the instrument you can see Bulgarian Scottish Polish Czech um, besides the basic five we have in Slovakia pictures on the right side that is a concert hall where we organize different concerts and venues and other activities uh, here you can see creative workshops uh, we also uh, organize uh, workshops for dancing uh, singing playing the instrument this is how the workshops look like we also have field trips which are very popular in june uh, every single day we had children from various schools. Uh, everything was financed from the Interreg program of the European Union. Mm, additional large project is uh, uh, monitoring the steps of old uh, instrument users. Uh, we also created a bike track. Uh, with uh, with uh, 
such stations with information tables and charts speaking about the particular parts of the culture so where there are, when there are children who are using the bike can also learn something about the culture we also prepared uh, publications songbooks and here you can see different educational materials and publications dvds songbooks and uh, children's lecture books now i would like to speak about a different project which is not financed from the interreg but it was financed from the fund for culture support and uh, this is one of the largest festivals in Slovakia, uh, one of the major ones. And I would like to say that we managed to place the convention and the 20th anniversary of the convention ratification. Uh, we will have many different activities, seminars, workshops, concerts. Uh, this not only comprises the village, but uh, we also want to merge uh, and want to, we would like to uh, the whole Slovakia to join our activities. Uh, and we are, we are at the full capacity. For example, we have concerts in Zuberec, Namestovo and in adjacent cities. We also have a novelty which we were surprised by because there is really huge interest in uh, participation and we had to uh, reject uh, certain participants and we had to start with the participation fee and it seems to be no problem for the uh, participants the hungarians czechs poles who will only who will travel from far abroad to uh, our concerts and it was we were really surprised that the interest is so huge that and we were surprised that the people from abroad do not have time to spend their money and time and to arrive this is about all of what i wanted to say during the concerts, we have two uh, competitions. This is the way my grandmother was singing. So this was about the songs which we used. There is also a competition of young instrument players, but it's focused on the younger generation. Uh, we want to encourage them to apply and to start using the instrument. Thank you for your attention. I still have one more minute, so I would like to continue. Uh, the municipality also has its own subsidy scheme, uh, and the firefighters, hunters, uh, football players can ask for money, but also uh, different uh, civic societies uh, can get uh, funds uh, for their own activities. For example, if you want to buy an instrument, or if you want to create a workshop, um, or it can be used for the functioning of the local centers or for the local uh, bodies and it's all from me thank you you still have time but we can use it for example for the discussion and uh, this is really another great example of how many activities can be can fit to uh, such a small village just like uh, Oravska Polhora, and this is not for free, it's for your endeavor and for your effort, and f also you had to write the project, so you should not be that modest, because really we can see that it's uh, loads of work that you carried out in order to motivate the younger, gen younger generation. Now it's the time for your questions, if you're interested in anything, please ask your questions but this is a unique opportunity and tomorrow uh, morning you will have an opportunity to take a look uh, at these uh, books and touch them and uh, read them everything clear to everyone so you're looking forward to the concert 
Okay, I will not torture you. You will still have an opportunity. Okay, there is one question. We'll have to wait for the microphone. There is another specific thing uh, in our municipality. We lost a certain generation of the instrument players in their 30s, 40s. Therefore, in order, in order to have enough uh, lecturers, we are using the younger generation and we have the bearer of the tradition who is 18 years old, who is already teaching the 12-year-olds, uh, who was already uh, taught by a 20-year-old uh, instrument player. So this is not an uh, intergeneration, but a generation exchange. So this is, uh, we were forced to use the really the youngest generation to teach the the next ones according to the newest uh, camaraderie or peer learning this is really a hand in hand with a modern educational uh, approaches thank you additional question <laughs> I just want to confirm, uh, really, it's exactly like you said, uh, people uh, which knew the techniques died, so our centers are a substitute of this teaching method. I'm asking the people, why are you arriving to our center? What was the, what was the motive? Why did you come? And why this given particular technique, the lace or knitting? because I didn't manage to learn it from my grandmother and I also didn't manage to learn it from my grandfather and basically we are substituting the generational exchange and there are many great uh, friendships uh, among our producers on one hand and the participants of the courses on the other hand and they're exchanging their information they come to us for example I brought the wood in order to make uh, the instrument I will, and I would like to show you how we did it. So this is really a community and basically we are uh, a, an artificial substitute of a family. Thank you. So it doesn't matter how it works. The most important thing is that it works. Are there any notes or comments? If not, we will be of your disposition. Thank you very much uh, for your participation that, that you shared your uh, experience. Also, I would like to thank uh, our guests from abroad and let me thank you again. And uh, last but not least, a uh, few technical details. Thank you, Lubica and all the pre-speakers. So, uh, here now I am here as a landlord of these premises, so I will inform you about some uh, special details. We have three minutes to go to the foyer of the theater part, and because we support each other, so we want to support our friends from L Latvia. So they are going to open an exhibition of the Latvian folk costumes. We have the ambassador of Latvia here and other uh, distinguished guests. Uh, so now we will finally get to that kind of vernissage where we will uh, be able to raise a glass to, to open the exhibition. And also uh, all of you who are here we are inviting you to a dinner. It's Please do not hesitate and do not hesitate and join us for the dinner. So uh, we reserved more time, so we have uh, the time to relax now. Uh, so first we will go to this uh, Latvian exhibition opening, and then uh, we will have at uh, 6.30 an interesting concert 
uh, interesting mixture between classical music and modern music, and then 8 o'clock in the theater, where we would like to invite you for this performance about uh, human being and the uh, earth. This is a modern art and uh, many activities which were presented by Oroska Polhora or Hrušo. They uh, overlap to those things which you have around, we have around us, so we look forward to uh, see you there. And then uh, it's up to you what will be the party. And I forgot, thank you for reminding me. Maybe uh, you are photographers, but uh, only tomorrow we are going to officially open the uh, exhibition of photographs. Sorry, it's a competition of photographs on living traditions. So even if you have something now here and you want to sign up to this competition, you can do it. And there are still some prizes waiting and awards waiting for you. So it's all under the convention on the safeguarding of this. And uh, moreover, Slovakia is celebrating 30 years of its uh, independence. Tomorrow we will have the minister herself to come and visit us. So a big ceremony is tomorrow, but you can start doing your photos today and send it to this competition. Uh, we are not uh, distributing or giving uh, a lot of uh, printed material. Yeah, the first years when, yes, we were collecting everything was we saw all on, uh, at all those UNESCO meetings, but everything you, you would uh, like, you will find it at the entrance to the theater. So uh, you're welcome.